Yes, it is. All right, this is the regular monthly meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education, Monday, September 9th, 2019, at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. As a reminder, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board during the reception of visitors later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over to my right. And uh, as we always do, we're going to go ahead and start off today with a flag salute with Whittier School and Principal Krugman. Thank you very much, Council, Advisors here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have Ms. Jenny Carey and Mr. Eric Miller, who are our student council advisors, and they will introduce our student council. There are actually going to introduce themselves on slide two, so we will let them do that and take it away. Uh, we're last year's uh, officers from the Whittier Student Council. Thank you for inviting us here to hear about what we do Whittier. My name is Ashton, and last year I was the secretary of the Student Council. My name is Brennan, and last year I was in the Post Office. My name is Cordelia, and last year I was the Public Affairs and Security. There's something you can do to clarify a little bit. We love having fun and showing our school pride. So spirit is the second part of our role at Woodland. Last year was DJ day, sports day, college day, dress like a civil day, hat day, day, movie star day, Minecraft day, and many more. Here are some pictures from our spirit days this past year. Charity sport is also a big part of our focus each school year. Each year we run for office guys so much it's always great hearing the uh, hard work that you guys put in to student council we have a couple of gifts here for you if you want to step forward So as you can see, our uh, student council is quite involved throughout the year, and uh, it is my pleasure to just share a little bit about Whittier with uh, each of the board members. Um, many of you are new from the last time we were here to uh, present uh, about Whittier, so it's exciting. Um, first, we'll start with our theme. Every year we have a theme at Whittier, and this year our theme is Find Your Superpower. 
So um, we do many different activities um, throughout the year that incorporate that theme, as well as many of the teachers are incorporating it within their classroom. So this year we started on day one with our um, newly annual clap in. We always do a clap out of our sixth graders on that last day of school, and this is the second year that we did a clap in of all of our students. So all the students came in um, to the theme of Superman into the building to start their uh, school year. Um, so it was really, really an awesome experience for everyone. Each morning then, we start our morning announcements with our um, Find Your Superpower weekly message. And so we have a, a quote from one of our superheroes each week um, for the kids to just incorporate into um, their actions and, and their thoughts for the, for the week. Last year, we celebrated our 90th anniversary at Whittier. And um, in doing so, it was time for us to update our vision statement. Not that it was 90 years old, but it uh, hadn't been updated in a number of years. And so we, um, we really had a lot of fun um, and a lot of thought um, put into our vision statement that we are now um, living on a daily basis. Um, our vision statement drives um, all that we do and the decisions that we make at Whittier. Uh, we had a committee of teachers and staff members, and then we presented it to our faculty, to our students, and to our parents. And so just briefly, our, our vision statement that we follow, Whittier strives to develop lifelong learners within a caring, safe, and healthy learning environment. Our staff will be responsive to each student and collaborate with families and community. Our students will solve problems with perseverance and develop a social conscience, which enables them to contribute to their school, family, and community. Together, we will be respectful of diversity and inclusivity, and we will positively impact the world. And that, in a nutshell, really tells what Whittier is all about. Um, and uh, we're really excited to continue our vision throughout the next 90 years, hopefully. So we, we focus on the child at, at Whittier, um, at all of our schools in District 58. And in doing so, we um, look at the academic and the student achievement focus area. Um, our school improvement plan addresses our areas of achievement in both reading and math. Um, and we continue to analyze our student achievement and our growth data throughout the school year. We look at the NWEA MAP scores. Uh, we look at the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, our State of Illinois mandated test. Um, and we look at those key performance indicators within our strategic plan. In addition, our building level formative assessments and just our reflections on how our students are doing, where our students are at, um, really, again, drives our instruction and what we do with our students. So by looking at each of those different areas, our achievement in reading, um, as indicated through our strategic goal 1.4 in the key indicators, the district target for K-6 in the spring of 2019 was 75%. That's what we wanted our district um, achievement to be. And at Whittier, we're proud to um, share that our achievement ranged from 78% to 98% in the area of reading. Um, so we're very proud of the progress that our students are making and, and the instruction that our teachers are giving. And in doing so, we look at these different areas. Our Fontes and Pinnell benchmarking, which is our one-to-one -one, um, reading conferences with our teachers and students. Our Benchmark Advanced and Study Sync, which is our uh, curriculum that we follow, uh, the K-5 Benchmark Advanced in the, the sixth grade study sync. Guided reading, that small group instruction that is so important. Um, to really meet those individual needs of our students. And then looking at the interventions, um, our primary LTR leading to reading um, in supporting our students on, on doing the best they can and in learning to read the best they can. Um, we have our Monday professional learning days. All of those together help us drive that ELA. Today was a perfect example um, with our Monday professional learning days. We did some data um, checks and some data um, informational meetings with our staff. We looked at our Fontes and Pinnell results. We looked at our spring map results to see where we're at now that we're in almost the third week of school. Um, our small group instruction is beginning, so we really want to make sure that our kids are getting what they need and their, their targets are being met. In the area of math, um, same thing. We looked at those uh, strategic goal 1.4 key indicators. Um, district target for K-6 for the spring of 2019, 71% of achievement. And again, at Whittier, we're proud to share that we uh, range from 83% to 96% kindergarten through sixth grade in our achievement in the area of math. And again, in doing so, we look at our curriculum, Math and Focus. That's our current math curriculum that the majority of our students are receiving. And then we have two grade levels doing our pilot math programs, the Bridges in Mathematics and the Envision Math. Um, so we've got four classrooms within our 14 that will be piloting the new math programs this year. 
our math talks, our number talks, have been real big in getting students to talk about math and really understand and, and understand that there are different ways to solve problems. They get the same answer, but they may get it in a number of different ways. Again, that small group instruction, um, following our guided reading, we're, we're putting together guided math groups too, so that the students are really getting what they need in that area. And then we will continue with our Monday professional learning days. We've only had two of them, so we haven't been able to do too much with uh, ELA and math, um, but that will be coming forward, especially with our pilot math programs, so the teachers can share with the other teachers who aren't doing the pilot math what that all entails. We can't forget SEL because we don't just teach our students the academics, but we look at the whole student. Um, and we are really big at, at Whittier, um, as I know we are at many of our DG58 schools, that if a student's not ready to learn, it doesn't matter what kind of a lesson, the, the greatest uh, resources that you've got, they're not going to be able to learn to their potential. So we really look at that SEL focus um, at Whittier. Our students continue to feel safe as a member of the Whittier community through our school theme, as I mentioned, our, our Find Your Superpower weekly quotes, our, our vision statement that we live by day to day, our Whittier Families Program. We're in the third year of having a families program at Whittier, which really mixes up all of our kids. We've got 13 different families within our building with 13 different family leaders, and the kids are mixed up kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, and it's really, really awesome to see those, those, those families develop and, and strengthen. Um, and they're sad when those sixth graders go on to the middle school and, and they're not in their family anymore, but they're really excited when those kindergartners come in and we've got a new family member each year or two. Our second step instruction, weekly instruction at kindergarten through sixth grade um, with second step, which is our SEL curriculum. And then our morning and class meetings that are daily. Those are happening daily now. Um, and many of the, the teachers will use that, that um, find your superpower weekly quote as a springboard um, for getting the kids talking um, about how they're feeling, what's going on, and, and what they need. And again, we will continue with our Monday professional learning days in focusing on that SEL piece as well. Um, as I stated, um, SEL is just as important as, as those academics. Our kids really need to, to be able to, to learn by, by feeling good about what they're doing. The last thing I'm going to talk about is our Explore program, uh, which concluded last week. Um, and that's where we're able to get our Fontes and Pinnell um, reading benchmark information. That's where we look in, and see what different reading um, levels our kids are at, how they're doing fluency-wise and how they're doing comprehension-wise. And we do this over three days, uh, and the kids really have a great time, as do the teachers and all of the staff, because all hands are on deck for our Explore program. Um, the kids are able to pick from 10 different classes, and they get to pick two of those classes, that the primary kids will participate in the morning, and the intermediate kids will participate in the afternoon, while the classroom teacher is then administering the, the Fontes and Pinnell benchmark. So the kids are getting some enrichment and some enhancement, some really out-of-the-box kinds of activities, um, while other kids are reading one-to-one -one with their classroom teacher. The, the data that we get and just that experience of that one-to-one -one reading time without being interrupted by this student needing to go to the bathroom or this student having a question about this um, really, really works. We have all of our specialists, our resource teachers, our specialist teachers, our instructional assistants, and we have a great group of parent volunteers. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without our parent volunteers who would support and help our staff as well. Um, so we've got a few pictures from a few of our classes. Um, we, we've got um, the kids having a lot of fun in our games program, our Flip It Awesome program, where they actually, the, the, the ending um, activity is flipping the bottles um, to get them to land straight, and they just use all of the different, um, uh, different types of uh, strategies for that. This year we had an outdoor adventures um, activity where the kids learned about camping and hiking and orienteering using a compass. Um, our fine arts program, we, we mix our art and our music together, and this time they created these beautiful butterfly wings um, from all of the classes, and then the kids go and get their picture taken um, with the butterfly wings coming out of their, their sides, which is, which is really cool. Our new PE teacher um, put together a PE teacher for a day program, so the kids got to learn those activities that are taught in PE class. Um, and then we had the inspiration creation station, where the kids were just putting together all different kinds of inspiring and, and, and imaginative um, quotes and messages that they then put throughout the school. They created two big banners for our kindergarten classes, welcoming them to kindergarten um, with some really neat messages for them. And then we got a, a picture of one of our teachers, who also happens to be here, um, conferencing with one of his students. Uh, Mr. Miller's up there conferencing with one of his students um, in, in that program. 
So it's, it's three days. We do it at the beginning of the year so that we can see where our kids are at, and then we do it again in the springtime. We don't have our sixth graders um, take that um, assessment since they're moving out of the middle school, but by then our kindergartners are reading. So we have our kindergartners in the mix, and, and we see where they're at and the progress that they have made. So um, we, we have a wonderful school community. Um, our students are awesome. Our teachers and staff are awesome. Our PTA is phenomenal, and you'll be hearing from them in a minute. Um, but you know, I, I just wanted to take a moment to, to share with you that you know, Whittier, while we're 90 years old, we're still strong. We're moving right along, um, and the kids are having a great time and learning lots. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share with you, being the first school of the year. And um, I would like to turn it over to our PTA co-presidents, Sarah Bogacek and Amy Cable, just to share a little bit about what PTA does at Whittier. Good evening. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much to the board for having us tonight. We just wanted to give a, um, a little snapshot of what we're working on as a PTA, what we've been doing the past couple of years. All right, so the first one is, whenever you hear PTA, I think immediately people's minds go to fundraising. You're gonna be asked to donate money. So a big goal of ours within our uh, PTA community is keep fundraising fun. Um, one of the ways that we're doing that is we really simplified into two main fundraisers, one in the fall, one in the spring. And typically our fall fundraiser is a local community jog. We've kind of upped the ante this year um, in the fun factor, and it's a color run. So if you guys are familiar with these, um, it's truly just a fun run around the building, but kids will be blasted with various <laughs> colored powder. Mr. Krugman was kind enough to demo it for the kids um, <laughs> at the start of the school year. They're super excited about it. Um, and in addition to events like that, as well as family fun nights at local restaurants where we get a kickback of the proceeds. And then our spring fundraiser, um, where we're tying in various experiences to raise money, whether we're curling with other parents or setting up a kickball event. <laughs> They're all fundraising experiences, but really with the common goal of building community as a bridge underneath all of those. So it doesn't feel too painful, hopefully writing those checks, because you know there's some other benefits involved. And with the unbelievable generosity of our <coughs> school families, as well as the community as a whole, we are able to fund so many wonderful programs. Um, one thing that we very, very hold high in our on our list of things is um, to the Whittier Angels, which is basically a program um, that we earmark um, a good portion of our PTA funds to um, support those in our community who may be um, less fortunate and would need fun lunch, for example, um, additional activities, school activities that. Um, you know, could be just extras, things like that. Um, teacher wish lists are another thing. Um, all the teachers in Whittier are able to just make a list of anything under the sun that would be helpful to them in their classroom. And um, we as a PTA are able to fund that. And then of course staff appreciation. We take an entire week in the spring where we just shower the staff with gifts and food and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and then we're always keeping a lens as looking through everything as to ways that we can just enrich experiences overall. Um, it's definitely not always about fundraising. We're trying to think about how to add on really supportive layers to our children's school experiences. And we do that through things like our annual variety show, which is um, it's not a fundraiser. It's really just an event where the kids can come together. We always say it's light on talent, high on entertainment. Um, and they get to get on the big stage of the Tivoli. They get to deal with tech rehearsals. It's a great experience, and it's just such a memorable thing that we all hold near and dear to our hearts. Um, and then we also bring in outside programs. For example, we had chess scholars, um, language stars, and this year we're fortunate where a parent came to us with a passion for children's theater, and she's bringing the local BAM theater program to our school and the kids will be putting on Susical. So we really think these are great compliments to an already great education and school experience. 
And lastly, we also make a point to um, really make sure that we are keeping the lines of communication open between parents um, and the community as a whole, um, as far as parent play dates, which <laughs> would be basically a coffee on the first day of school, so people can come and catch up on their summer and um, just kind of take a little breather after all the kids get off and out the door. Um, we offer school supply kits um, for ease of shopping at the beginning of the year, and of course, everyone's favorite, fun lunch. <laughs> Every other Friday, um, parents love not having to worry about packing those lunches, and that's something that we offer as a PTA as well. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for all the hard work that you do for the video. Thanks again for sharing with us. Next up on the agenda, we have a public hearing on the proposed 2019-2020 legal budget. So we're going to go ahead and start this off with a brief comment from Todd Drayfall. Yes, good evening. This is the last uh, part of the budget, uh, last uh, stage of the uh, FY20 budget. If we started back in October of last year with the tax levy introduction and then approval of the levy in November, uh, followed up by a April uh, budget workshop. Uh, the tentative and display budget was put on display at the, after the July board meeting. Uh, there was a budget workshop uh, 26th of August uh, that uh, the, the board had. And this is the final piece. So the budget's been on display for 30 days. It's a balanced budget operationally. Uh, it has a lot. We've added uh, about 9.8 FTE into this year's budget uh, compared to last year, uh, as well as accommodating uh, the new professional development model uh, and, and making adjustments as you know, and and adjusting for all three uh, contracts that have been approved since uh, the last budget was approved. So. Um, if there are any questions, then? No. OK. Thank you. All right, then at this time, I declare the hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please stand, state your name, attendance area, and organization, if any, for the record. Okay, then if there's going to be no comments, I now declare that this hearing is closed at 7.23 p.m. So we'll now move on to the adoption of the 2019-2020 legal budget recommended by the Assistant Superintendent of Business. Having prepared a tentative budget and having made the same, uh, made the same conveniently available for public inspection for at least 30 days prior to public hearing and further having considered input on the tentative budget and determined to make adjustments to that document. Is there a motion to adopt the 2019-2020 legal budget as presented in final form? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the 2019-2020 legal budget. Now on to our non-action reports, starting off with our Spotlight on Schools, the one-to-one -one learning update with Dr. Ike Miller. Good evening, and uh, thank you. Grateful for the opportunity to provide the board and community with a, uh, an update on our one-to-one -one learning program. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about why we're one-to-one. -one. Uh, it's a good reminder to remember uh, why our community and why our district has invested so many resources and so much time into this initiative. Uh, and this list uh, of reasons or this rationale for why we're one actually predates my time in the district. It goes back to when the one-to-one -one initiative uh, started back in 2013, 2014. Uh, and, and back then, when this is a little more cutting edge and there weren't that many districts doing it, I think the, the district took a hard look at 
uh, is it worth it and why should we do this and, and what reasons and how is it going to benefit our program? Uh, and so this is the list uh, of reasons they came up with. And when we revisited this concept in 2017, as we were looking at it, when it came time to, to reinvest in the program, uh, the Innovative Learning and Technology Committee looked at the list that was four years old, and, and we felt that it was still a strong list and that all these reasons were still applicable. And that this uh, was really a good rationale for, for why we need to provide this opportunity for our students. Uh, you'll notice in the list that academic achievement is on the list, but it's certainly not the only thing on the list. Absolutely, our students performing well academically is, is, is in the end, you know, one of our most paramount and primary focuses, but, uh, but there's a lot of other things that, are, that we value as well. And I, I think you'll hear me talk about a lot of items in the list, but one of them to, to really think about too is equity and learning resources. And if you go back to 2013, 2014, I, I think one of the things that started this conversation in District 58 was that so many schools were starting to do this on their own. Uh, back then it was with, uh, with white MacBooks, so the technology looked a little bit different. But you know, schools were investing in technology on their own, PTAs and parents were getting involved and schools were using building budget because they saw the power and what it could do. Uh, and, and so I think when the district needed to stop and take a look and said, if this is valuable, we should be able to provide this to all of our students at all of our schools and provide those same opportunities across the district. Uh, so again, I, I think you'll hear me speak a lot about some of the other items in the list, but I think there's, there's a lot of benefit that our teachers see, that our students see, and that our community sees uh, in, in offering this technology to our students. Any decision that we make as a district, you know, we always want to look to our mission statement uh, to guide that decision. Uh, and it, I highlighted, I have our mission statement up on the, uh, on the screen. And I also highlighted that last sentence, or part of that last sentence, right? Lifelong learners and contributing members of a global society. And I think it's something we hear a lot, and, and I think you, you see that in a lot of mission statements for a lot of school districts. But I also think it's something that, that, that schools and really the community at large kind of struggles with what it means anymore, right? It's a, really, it's a really hard thing to grasp right now, especially with the rate of change that we're seeing out in the world. Uh, so if we really stop and think about what it means to be a lifelong learner and a contributing member of a global society, uh, I, I think I'm going to point to the research of Tony Wagner. I'm going to... You guys will forgive me, I'm going to show you a few videos tonight, but one of, uh, this first one here, uh, I think uh, Mr. Wagner does just an excellent job of, of capturing what we're looking for here. How many of you had to memorize the periodic table in high school? Raise your hands. Ah, everybody. Good. So how many were there again? Uh, no, wait, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Whatever number you came up with is wrong. while I Google them. Let's see who's quicker. <laughs> Knowledge is a commodity. The world no longer cares whether or not you're smarter than a fifth grader or how well you do a trivial pursuit. What the world cares about is not what you know, but what you can do with what you know. And that is a completely different education problem. Then the question becomes, do you have the skill and do you have the will to use the knowledge you have acquired? Okay, so I gotta tell you kind of an intellectual journey I've been on. 2005, I read The World is Flat by Friedman. How many have read that book? Scared the heck out of me, because as you know, he describes a world where increasingly any job that can be routined is rapidly being offshored or automated. White collar, blue collar, doesn't matter. I talked to him recently, interviewed him for the new book. He said, I got one thing wrong in that book. I said, what was that? He said, the pace of change. It's happening so much faster. So I worried about what kinds of skills will our young people need to get and keep a good job in this new global knowledge economy. And in fact, are they the same skills they'll need for citizenship and for continuous learning? Started interviewing a wide range of innovators, literally from Apple to Unilever, executives, US Army, community leaders, college teachers, asking all of them, what are the skills that matter most today? What's important? Came to understand there's a set of core competencies every young person must be well on the way to mastery before he or she finishes high school. Not just to get a good job, but to be a continuous learner and an active and informed citizen in the 21st century. Very briefly, they are, number one, critical thinking and problem solving. What do they mean by critical thinking? The ability to ask the right questions, ask really good questions. Number two, collaboration across networks and leading by influence. Number three, agility and adaptability. Number four, initiative and entrepreneurialism. Number five, effective oral and written communication. 
Number six, accessing and analyzing information. And lastly, number seven, curiosity and imagination. So a couple of things happened when that book came out three and a half years ago. This is the global achievement gap that Homer just referred to. First of all, I got a kind of affirmation from literally around the world that simply stunned me. Taiwan to Singapore to Helsinki to Madrid and kind of all places in, in between. Uh, Thailand, Bahrain, Birmingham, England. From Wall Street to West Point, people said to me, yep, these are exactly the right skills. I felt pretty good. So yeah, we've got the seven uh, skills that Tony Wagner finds up there. And you'll notice there's, there's a fair amount of overlap with the seven skills that Tony Wagner lists and the reason why District 58 uh, chooses to be a one-to-one -one district. And, and so I, I feel like that tells us that we're on target for, for the right types of goals and the skills we want to develop with our students. Uh, and again, thinking about those things that we want them to be able to do by the time they graduate from high school and for us by the time uh, they move on to, to, to the high school. Um, so pulling that together, if we think about other content areas like math and English language arts, we've got the Common Core, uh, the Common Core standards and we have the Next Generation Science standards. So in technology education, uh, the, the, the gold standard, so to speak, would be the ISTE standards, and that's the International Society for Technology and Education. It's a very large international organization, and, and they've done a pretty good job over the past several decades of having technology standards for educators, for students, uh, and they've even been increasing that for school leaders and instructional coaches. And, and so a, as a body, they, they've done a really good job of, of helping guide schools what they should be doing with technology. Their most recent refresh, and I believe it was 2016, where they did student standards, they really stopped and stepped back and shifted and said, you know what, our standards are, are, are too focused on the tools and less on what we want students to be able to do with the tools. So again, I think it's kind of tying in what Tony Wagner is talking about and what we want for students to be contributing members of a global society. So to kind of quickly, I know it's hard to see there, so to quickly go through, right? Uh, you know, innovative designer, uh, students who can solve problems and uh, you know, imaginative solutions and using a variety of digital, tool, digital tools. So these are the types of things we want. These are why students are one-to-one. -one. It's hard to do that without access to technology, without having those tools in place. A computational thinker. Um, you know, we, we've, we, I, I feel like in the district we've had a lot of good luck with, with coding. A lot of teachers have gotten excited about that. And we've had uh, a lot of different resources out there, whether we've got kindergartners and first graders working on block-based coding all the way up into the middle school level where we have students programming drones and doing different sorts of things. I think we're doing, you know, we could always do better, but I think it's an area where we're doing a good job. Uh, you know, something you'll, you'll hear a lot about lately is artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's something we're going to start looking into and how can we get our students ready for these cutting edge topics. Uh, again, you know, technology is re really needs to be in place to start to develop those skills. Empowered learners. I, I think that this, is, this is a really important one and I think, uh, you know, you hear us talk about Seesaw a lot or me talk about Seesaw a lot. Uh, if we want students, and I think the research is just so strong in this one, that if students are setting their own goals, if they're invested in their own learning, it's going to be impactful. Uh, and so technology makes that so much easier. Our students can reach below their desk or under their desk and, and pull out an iPad and access all this information. Uh, they can access all these tools. They can collaborate with their peers. They can collaborate with their teacher. It really empowers them to have some choice, and we've uh, been trying to design systems to support teachers to give them those choices. So I, I think uh, technology really accelerates that. Digital citizen. Um, you know, this is, this is the challenging one for school districts. I've actually been part of a, a group of educational technology, uh, or technology educa educators, I should say, in DuPage County that we've been meeting a couple times a year and trying to, to solve this problem and improve what we're doing in the area of digital citizenship. Uh, one of the things that we keep coming to is that it's not just being a digital citizen, it's being a citizen. Uh, and I think uh, the work that we've done as a district with social emotional learning has really supported us, right? We've, we've been working so hard with our students for the past five or six years to, to be good citizens, to make good choices and make good decisions. And I think, uh, I think that dovetails well with the, the digital side of it. Uh, you know, one of the other things we talk about being a digital citizen is, is we want it to be a list of do's, not just a list of don'ts. Right? So how can we talk about what students shouldn't be doing with technology, uh, but how can we talk about what they should be doing? And knowledge constructor, I think later on you'll see an example of a sixth grade student that does just such a good job of this, right? Can, can, you know, and it's also like Tony Wagner talks about, it's not just finding the information, right? Information is so easily accessible. How can you pull information together and create knowledge? Uh, it's a skill that's really important for our students to have. And global collaborator, 
Uh, you know, again, this is a challenging one in school, so I guess we're always concerned with privacy and student safety, but can we find ways for students to collaborate with each other and to, to broaden their world? I see uh, a good example, I see this all the time, are, are librarians that are uh, tweeting authors, and I'll tell you, authors are, are, are just so great at, at replying back and answering questions of students, and so finding things like that that we can get students to get outside perspectives can be really powerful. Finally, creative communicator. I, I feel like we've had a lot of success with this one, especially in this past year, uh, as, as we refreshed our iPads and we kind of renewed this initiative. We focus on a lot of the creative tools that we have at our disposal. And I think we've seen our students uh, really create some cool, uh, some really cool and exciting ways to share their learning. Uh, and, and so I think we've done a good job with, with this one in particular. So kind of, Last thing is we think about the why. As a, as, a, as a room of adults, I think it's interesting to stop and reflect. You know, is it worth it to be one-to-one, -one and why are we one-to-one? -one? I think it's worth taking a minute to stop and think about how do we learn. So I asked you guys a few questions to kind of, you know, as, as a room, as a group, to think about it rhetorically, right? When you, when you define and access information to answer a question, where do you search for it? If you're, if, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, you're probably thinking of the name of a search engine, right? That's become a verb, right? I think most people, when you want to find something, I think the, the fastest way to do it is to pull out a device and search for it on Google or on a, on a search engine. And, and, and that's great. It's just so easily accessible. Obviously, there's a downside to that. And I think, again, our librarians do a great job of, of making that a, a, a skill that's refined where students know how to evaluate that information they're finding and, and put it together. But, but I think if we want our students to have that skill, that I think most adults, that's how we find our information first. I think we need to start, uh, we need to have them do it in a controlled environment where we can support them and have them make good decisions and learn how to do it well. Next question to think about is when you, when you learn a new skill, what resource do you use? Right? If you have to learn something new, if the, if the dishwasher breaks, if, uh, if you've got to put the chain back on your, on your child's bike, if you've got to find some, figure something like that, like that out, where do you go? Again, if a lot of you are like me, you're probably thinking, YouTube, right? YouTube is something that I, I, in my job, I have a love-hate relationship with. I, I, it is a fantastic and it is an amazing resource. I, I think if there's one spot in the world that has more uh, learning power, it, it's YouTube. There is so much knowledge and so much information on YouTube, you can learn almost anything, which is just so amazing and so powerful for our students to have access to that. Now, obviously, we, we all know the downside of that as well. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube that we don't want our children to see. So it's a really hard thing for us to manage at schools. It's something we continue to work on. But again, if, if we want our students to have that skill, if we want them to be able to go to YouTube or to another digital resource and learn how to do something, I think we need to have them do it in a controlled environment, teach them how to do it well. And I think that's part of why we're one-to-one. -one. A couple more here. Bear with me. Uh, when you're collaborating, how do you communicate and interact? Right, if you're working on a project with a team of people. Uh, you know, I, I think this answer would have been different 10 years ago. Uh, might have been a little bit different five years ago. Uh, I, <laughs> I also have a love-hate relationship with email, right? I, I, think, I think like anyone who gets a lot of email, it, it takes up a lot of time and sometimes I feel like, you know what, I just want to go talk to someone on the phone or go have a face-to-face -face, uh, conversation and there's a lot of value in that as well. But, but, but think of how efficient it has made us as well. Uh, so again, there, there's, there's a balance there. I also think about Google Docs. You think about the free resource that we make available to our students. Uh, I, I know in, in my line of work, when someone sends me a Word document that I have to collaborate on, it really feels tedious, right, to have to uh, download it and track changes and send it back to them. I, I think the power of our students being able to jump online one document and collaborate, whether it's a slide deck, it, has been really powerful. And I think sometimes we underestimate that, you know, again, we want them to have those skills when they leave our district, we need to work on that and shape that with them here. Again, when you share your ideas, what tools do you use to organize and present them? This, I think, is a really hard one to imagine doing without technology. Uh, you know, obviously, here I am with a, uh, with a slide deck tonight, and, and I think we also all know that slide decks are always not the most exciting thing. Uh, but, but it's also a really powerful tool to organize your information and to make visuals and to share your ideas with others, right? And that's what we want our students to be able to do. We want them to be able to f create information, create or create, take information, create knowledge, share their ideas. And we, so we need to provide them with a wide variety of digital tools to do that. So again, just a few minutes, I want you guys to, to have some background. This is why we think this is so important. Uh, you know, I, I, we're certainly not doing it perfect, but I think uh, it's an initiative that we've had for a long time and we're gonna continue to keep trying to do it better, but I think I'm really proud of a lot of the work we've done and, and the access that we've provided to our students. All right, so this past spring, we uh, gave surveys to our students and to our families 
and to our teachers. So uh, I'm going to give uh, a quick overview of some of the data. There's a lot of data there. And uh, so you're aware the, this presentation, as well as the raw survey data, was made public, I believe, at the start of the board meeting. So that is available if you want to dive into all the data and, and the comments. Because I am giving, uh, uh, there's a lot of information, and I don't want to keep everyone here until 10 o'clock tonight. So, uh, so I'm going to try to give a quick overview. But there's certainly a lot of good information to be gleaned uh, with, with a lot of varying perspectives from the comments on those surveys. So quickly, the, uh, the respondent totals, you, you can see the numbers have been uh, you know, fairly steady. There's a little variance in the student responses one year. It's also worth noting that 2014 was a pilot year. Uh, there were about one-third of the district, uh, one-third of the students in the district participated in that. And the way that worked for the 2013-2014 school year was that teachers applied uh, to be a part of the program. So if you think about what that does to the data, it's just good perspective to have that all the teachers that did it were very excited about doing it uh, and, and were very purposeful in what they were doing with it and kind of recognized that, 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 it, that they were leading the district through the start of the one-to-one -one phase. So the only students that were responded were students of those teachers that were very excited about it. And the only parents that were surveyed and families were parents of those families as well. So the, the data does naturally look a little bit different for that year. So there's a series of questions we'll go through, the idea being uh, parents were indicating their degree of agreement with the following statements about their child's experiences with the one-to-one -one program. Okay. So engagement is something that we, we talk a lot about in schools. I mean, we know that uh, engagement is really important, and we see technology as something that is very engaging for students. Uh, you know, one of the perspectives that, that someone shared with me in the summer that I think that we as educators need to do a better job of is talking about engagement. Because I think educators get really excited about engagement. Uh, and I think we view technology as something that is very engaging for students. But I think when we tell parents and families that iPads are engaging, parents kind of think, yeah, I know, right? I can't get my kid off the iPad. So I think engagement really uh, means something different for families. So I think it's, it's, this is something that as a district we need to communicate uh, and help our families understand that there's different types of engagement and that we want students engaged in learning tasks and we want to find learning tasks that are exciting and engaging. Uh, so in this slide here, I, I think this is an area where uh, we'd like to see some growth. I, I think the numbers have, have, you know, there was a drop from 2015 to 2017. Um, and so our parents are not viewing their children as being more engaged in schoolwork. So I, I think uh, with a lot of these with parents, I, I'm going to continue to hope that as we uh, get to a point of full, uh, fully initiated, the, 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 I'm sorry, the Seesaw Initiative is in full implementation. Uh, I think we'll hope to see some of these numbers start to, uh, start to shift a little bit. So this slide is a uh, child is involved in collaborative activities with classmates. So here is an area where I, I think we did notice a little bit of a bump. Uh, I, I think we saw uh, the agree and the strongly agree numbers go up. And I, I think we saw something there. So I think that's something that we can get excited about. Again, could we possibly attribute this to, to some increased use, uses last year? It's hard to say. Uh, but it's an area where parents did notice a little bit of an increase. Uh, more varied work products. Uh, and again, the, this was kind of an interesting chart. As you look at it, you can see, you know, again, I'm looking at the green numbers being 2019. Uh, you can see that we had some people kind of get off the fence on this one and either decide they were going to they were going to disagree with this or agree with it. We saw increases on both ends of the data here. Uh, so you know, I'm glad that some parents are seeing more varied work products for the parents that are strongly disagreeing and disagreeing. Uh, you know, we want to hope that we can, one, have students creating more varied work, work products. And we've got some plans in place to continue to work on that. Uh, and then two, also make sure parents are seeing those. That's also been one of our struggles. And there is a, a slide where, where students are asked if they share their work with their parents. Uh, and again, I think Seesaw was kind of our answer to that. We kept asking over years, we would, we would encourage students to go home and take out their iPads and show their parents, or encourage parents to, to ask their children to take out their iPads and show them the work. And, and I think uh, Seesaw hopefully has, has mitigated some of the need for that. So, this slide is from a different survey uh, that I will have to double check and see if the results, the raw data for that survey was posted. But this is the Parent Partnerships Survey from the spring of 2019. If they haven't been posted to the website yet, I, I will uh, work, work with our team and make sure that the uh, raw data does get posted as well. Uh, but this is a, a larger 20-some question survey uh, as part of our strategic planning initiatives about parent partnerships that was uh, sent to parents last spring. And, and I thought there was one question that was relevant uh, to this topic and worth including. 
So again, you can see parents are asked about uh, access to information about their child's learning experience. And an overwhelming number of parents, 581 out of you know, around 650, Said, said that yes, uh, they have the opportunity to access that information. So that's something that I think that we can re really be proud of, that, our, that almost all of our parents feel like, yes, I can access that information. And, and I would say, in my opinion, that, that if there's any one piece of information that our parents are going to access, I think that might be the most important uh, about the learning experience. And it just, I, I felt, uh, it seemed like a, a good, parent email to include this, this uh, I think Megan got this as a response to one of the messages that went out at the start of the school year, or one of Dr. Russell's messages that went out at the start of the school year. Uh, so just some unsolicited feedback on CISA, and again, I, you'll hear me talk about it a lot tonight, and you've heard me actually talk about it a lot over the past uh, couple years. I just think it's a tool that, that does so much for our district and for our one-to-one -one initiative. Um, and, and so I think our parents are starting to notice. And again, this year, I know it seems like we've been using it for a long time and talking about it for a long time, but this year is actually our first year of full, of full implementation. We're, we're using the paid version of Seesaw for Schools, uh, and all of our elementary students uh, and teachers are using it this year. So, so whatever gains we've seen so far, I hope we continue to see as we reach full implementation. Student responses. So, yeah, you know, there was a K-2 survey and there's a 3-8 survey. That I've just highlighted some data from the 3-8 survey, again, the full uh, raw data is available on, the, on, uh, on board docs. Uh, so again, this is that question that I refer to often. Do you show your parents your work and your accomplishments on your iPad? Uh, once in a while is the most common answer. So again, this is a, this is a hard thing to get people to do. It's kind of like that, that, that same old question of, uh, of, of, you know, what did you do at school today? And the child will typically say nothing, right? Even though, even though we all know that's not true. Uh, so Seesaw, again, has really facilitated that. We did see a little bit of an increase uh, you know, across the board, once per week, many times per week, almost every day. So again, that might be attributable to Seesaw, but either way, we saw a little bit of an increase there, which is exciting. Uh, also, as I go through these, I want you to notice how different each of these answers is. And, I, and, I, and what that tells me is that our students are being thoughtful, thoughtful through, uh, with these questions and they're being honest. Uh, so I think it's kind of good to reflect on. So how often do you work in a project with a friend? And again, I think these are some good discussions to have with our Innovative Learning and Technology Committee. Is what, what, what are our goals here? I certainly don't think everyone answering every day is the right answer. That's probably not realistic. A reminder I'll give for all these questions is we, we still promote a blended learning environment. We, we don't want our students on their iPads all day. That, that's not the goal, nor has it ever been the goal of our program. Uh, I, I, you know, as far as we don't want them all in every day, but I, I would probably like to see that uh, some more of those once a month answers becoming uh, once a week. I, I think uh, iPad provides some great opportunity for student collaboration, so I think we'll continue to support our teachers in thinking about uh, how they can have their students collaborating with their, uh, with their iPads. And how often do you use uh, your iPad to create uh, multimedia projects like movies? So, I, you know, this is one that I, I'll be honest, I, I was hoping we'd see a little bit more of a bump. I think the once a week number went up and the once a month number uh, went up and, uh, and then never went down, which I was glad to see. Um, but, you know, it's something we'll, we'll continue to try to focus on. I, I think, again, we'll, I'll talk about a project that everyone did last year that I, that I think will help this effort. Uh, that we could start having some norms across the district and exposing all teachers to some of the great tools that we have uh, can see some of these numbers increase. Uh, so schoolwork has been more interesting. So this is kind of w w what I'm talking about with with, uh, <coughs> with engagement, right? I, 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 I don't think this is a number that we should take for granted that 90% of our students, and again, there was an increase last year, which is, again, it's hard to say what that's attributed to. As a reminder, 2019 was the first year we'd surveyed students after the refresh and the renew. So we had new devices, uh, new devices for our students that were able to update a little bit further. They were bigger. We had keyboards for our third grade through sixth grade students. So I think some opportunities that our, that our students appreciate it. But uh, I, I think the fact that our students think schoolwork is more interesting is something to get really excited about. I, I think student, we, we, we want our students to enjoy school and be interested in the work that they're doing. And when that happens, they're, they're clearly going to be more engaged in it. Um, something else that, that as a committee we reflected on a little bit with these questions is we like the idea of keeping the questions the same because of, we want to have longitudinal data but I think we're probably hitting the point where we need to rework some of these questions because a lot of our students don't remember or didn't go to school when we weren't one-to-one. -one. In fact, a majority of our students didn't. So, uh, I, you know, we're hoping that they could, we, we, we were hoping they would look at these questions as maybe before they were using them regularly or often throughout the school year, but I, I think at some point we'll have to reword these questions because there's, there may not be a recent history of not being one-to-one. 
Uh, again, working with friends in, uh, in school is easier and more fun. Uh, you know, and, I, and I think some people might say, well, you know, reflect on the word fun being in there and say, is that our goal? Uh, and, and I would say partly yes. Uh, we, we want students to come to school with a smile on their face. We want them to be excited to come back to school uh, when the school year starts. We want it to be a happy place for them. So I think uh, the idea that they can collaborate with friends and, and that process is more fun and the technology makes it easier. 82% of our students uh, said they agreed to that. It's something to be very excited about. Again, I learn more. And again, you'll notice these numbers went down a little bit for every chart, right? So I, again, I think our students are being honest, but I think is 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 valuable to know that you know this one, uh, not as many students said yes, but still a lot of them. Uh, and again, we saw an uptick, but a lot of students, 68%, saying they learn more when they're using their iPads. So our students definitely uh, de definitely see a lot of value in the initiative. Uh, and you know, if you read through the uh, the comments from the students. You know, again, I, I, think, I think they're really honest. They, they like the one-to-one -one initiative, but in the comments, they leave a lot of good reasons why it benefits their learning. Uh, yes, they also very much ask, uh, ask the district to put the App Store back on there and allow them to download Fortnite. I mean, those requests were there as well, <laughs> to be clear. They're, they're very good at advocating for what they want. But, uh, but I think they put in some really honest and, and open feedback on, on why it helps them learn, and I think we saw a lot of good responses from our students in those comments. So the teacher survey was a little bit different this year. The, again, the Innovative Learning and Technology Committee last spring looked at all these survey tools, and again, we decided to keep the same tools for parents and students uh, to kind of have that longitudinal data. We looked at some paid tools, and some, there, there's some tools that uh, a lot of school districts in the Chicago area use that have some costs associated with them. Um, we decided to hold off on that and keep, uh, continue using what we have. But for the teacher survey, we, we found a free resource that's uh, offered via Apple. It's called the Learning Technology Survey. And, and so we re the, the committee really liked the questions that were there, and they liked the example data that we got back and thought it might be actionable and provide us kind of a new insight into what our, our teacher perceptions on the one-to-one -one initiative were. So again, in this, we posted the summary data. This time, we don't have detailed individual data uh, from Apple, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm not entirely sure if we'll be able to uh, secure that or not. But we do have the summary data for these survey questions. So I'll kind of quickly run through a few of them. So this is teachers' sense of how prepared they are uh, for teaching with technology. So I think these are some pretty promising numbers. Again, I'm, I'm glad that, that you know, almost 90% of our teachers feel they're prepared to use technology. I'd absolutely like to see the moderate, you know, we, we like to get more teachers from moderately to vary, so we want to continue to offer uh, professional learning opportunities and, and embed those into all of our professional learning opportunities. Um, this one, there's a, a lot more information here, but uh, professional learning goals. So this is asking teachers what they would like to focus on. Now, you'll see the alignment. This is a, a I think Apple, this is a research-based tool they use, and they put a lot of thought into it, and they, they, it's delivered uh, to a lot of school districts across the, across the nation. Um, and so you'll see these tie, you'll see some of these same things, right? Fostering creativity, um, <clears throat> you know, collaboration. These things that tie back to those ISCI standards and the things that Tony Wagner talked about. So you'll note the, the thing that the teachers are significantly interested in at the top is designing lessons, um, designing lessons that in, engage students in, in the real world. And lower on the bottom is integrating coding. Okay? So either they feel that they already have enough coding going on or just not a priority with all the other things that they have going on. Uh, so again, you get a, a spectrum of things there. This is teacher perception on um, students and what students can do. So again, our teachers feel pretty strongly that students create more professional looking products, technology, than other than the traditional media. I'll show you a couple great examples of that in a minute. Uh, and, and down on the lower end, it was interesting, teachers interact uh, with each other more while working with technology. Students are able to manage their own learning with technology and they're, they're not likely to remain on task when they're using technology. And those answers aren't surprising to me. Again, I, technology, as much as I, I think it enhances our learning experience, it can absolutely be a distraction, whether at home or at school. So we've done our best to provide teachers with, with a tool set to help manage that. At the elementary level, our teachers have access to Apple Classroom, which allows them to lock students into one iPad app and to see all of their screens to help manage that aspect. At the middle school level, we have a tool called GoGuardian that does something sim similar. Now, in addition, you know, for example, at our new teacher week, we talk to our teachers about some strategies uh, to, to work with, uh, to have tra you know, transitions in the classroom and to keep students on task. So it's definitely something that, that uh, we'll continue to focus on. And I think this is the last one here. I, I thought what was interesting uh, here is that you'll see real-world engagement is something 
um, that students are doing less frequently. So I thought that was an interesting dichotomy there. The teachers are recognizing, hey, this is something I'm interested in learning, and they're also recognizing it's something that not students are doing often or frequently. Uh, so I, I see that as a really good opportunity for us to support our teachers in looking at real-world engagement activities. All right. I know that was a lot of information. I'm trying to <laughs> move quickly here, so let me know if you have any questions. Um, the next part that I'll move on to is... I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, at the bottom yeah. of the last slide you just showed, yes. um, the, the lightest blue, that should be frequently, not infrequently. Is that, am I reading that? Am I making the correct assumption? The lightest blue is infrequently. Yes. I mean, the, you know, of course, I'm looking at this one, which has, does not have very good color. So, so the... You have two infrequently. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, it does. Yeah, I see. Thank you for catching that. I did not notice that. I was just looking at the screen. So that, and this is from five points. For this is from Apple's report. So I will uh, yeah, <laughs> throw them under the bus. No, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for catching that. I will go back and right, now, now I'm curious. Now, does the other slide have it? No. Okay. I will follow up on that. Thank you for catching that. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Anything else before I move on? All right. So the Benchmark Essential Question Project is something that as we were looking at, again, last year being our refresh and renew and thinking about, uh, thinking about our one-to-one -one learning program, one of the things we wanted, one of the pieces of feedback that we'd heard was, was the inconsistency with the first, uh, with the first iteration of our one-to-one -one initiative. That uh, th there was some wide discrepancy between, well, if you got this teacher, they were going to use the iPads a lot. And if you got this teacher across the hall, you might use the iPad less frequently. Um, and so part of that w w was I, I think the district should take ownership in the professional development supports that we offer. And, and I think so in trying to remedy that, one of the things we said is let's have some absolutes. Let's have a project that we can say everyone did. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the, the project that we said for last year is what we're doing last year was the first full year of Benchmark being our ELA resource in grades K through 5. Um, and kindergarten was a little bit different because they're not one-to-one, -one, and so we had some, uh, a different uh, activity that all kindergarten students participated in. But in grades 1 through 5, and then in 6th grade we did something a little bit different for, uh, for social studies that I'll talk about. But in grades 1 through 5, all students created a digital project that demonstrated their understanding of the essential question for at least one benchmark unit prior to the end of the school year. So what's an essential question? I'll show you a couple examples here in a minute. But each unit in benchmark has a, an overarching essential question that kind of uh, encapsulates everything they're learning about. And sometimes they're pretty deep and complex questions. Um, and so they may not always answer the essential question, but they might learn some information relating to that essential question. And so this was just a norm. And, and, and we asked all teachers to have their students complete this at least once. So I can say, that every student in grade one through five completed this activity. Uh, and it had the ISTE standard related uh, down there at the bottom, that creative communicator that I spoke about earlier. And I think this really captures that well, right? Complex ideas, uh, and they're communicating those clearly and effectively using d digital tools. Uh, so this is a great example of that. Clips is one tool that, that you probably have seen. I, I think it was fun for me seeing last year all as uh, PTAs came out, I'm sorry, as uh, schools came in and, and did presentations. Clips is a tool that was used a lot last year to create those presentations because it's just such a fun and easy to use tool. So before I show some examples, I thought I'd show, it's kind of a longer email, uh, but I, I got this email in, in May, uh, right at the end of the school year. And, and I think it's important to share because I, it might seem small and I'm saying, you know, a, a big deal. So people did this thing one time throughout the whole school year. I mean, is that, how's that gonna solve our problems? You have to remember, our teachers have, and I know you guys remember, but our teachers have a lot on their plates right now. I think everyone's well aware of that, and they've got a lot going on. So I, I had to stand up at a meeting in January and, and talk to all the different grade levels and say, hey, here's one more thing to put on your plate. Uh, it, it wasn't a particularly, you know, something that I was particularly excited about doing, but it was important, and, and I knew that, that it could lead to some really good things. And, and this was a teacher that very respectfully pushed back uh, you know, with me on this, and this is a first grade teacher. Uh, and the feedback she gave me is she says, you know, I wasn't excited about it, uh, I was feeling really overwhelmed, a lot on her plate, uh, but at the end it was a really positive experience. And I, and I think that's part of the goal. If we can get every teacher to do this once and every student to do this once, I think we're showing people uh, that, that it's worth the investment in time in the class. And if you can spend a little time showing students these tools, that, that the burden for you to be the expert too, and again, this is a first grade teacher, that let the students explore and then they're teaching each other and they're teaching the te uh, teacher. So, uh, so I think if we keep taking small, consistent steps across the district, I think we'll see substantial gains. 
It hates me! Mosquito. So the events in my story, so I caused all the problems. I told a tall tale. I, t I buzz. I buzzed in people's ears. I knocked the owlet out of the nest. My mistake was I lied. I told a tall tale. And my lesson learned was if I lie, I will get in trouble. Smiley face. So, if you can get beyond the fact that it's the, 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 that six or seven year old's really cute voice and, and the cute little mosquito buzzing around, think about the content that that student was talking about, and look at that, look at that essential question up there, right? So, so not only, uh, I mean, I think it's a pretty complex idea, and that a first grader, a six or seven year old, was able to talk about and kind of explain it in relation to a story that they read, but then also create a really kind of fun visual and learn a creative skill. So, I, I think I, I think that captures a lot, and why why do we put this technology in the hands? of first graders, I think, so they can do things like this and so they can create knowledge and share their learning in creative ways. Here's a third grade example. something that took uh, a ton of time, but a teacher carved out the time and said, that, you know, let, let's, let's answer this question. You know, why, do living, why do living things change was the essential question for this unit. Again, I think the student is going to have a pretty strong understanding and they're going to remember this content pretty well. They, went, they were able to pick out all those animals and point to the reasons. So again, I, I think putting technology in the hands of a third grader uh, can yield some pretty powerful results. This next, ex next example uh, is a, it'll be my, my last example. Uh, last example, I know I could show you guys them all night long, but uh, we, we, we only have so much time, um, is for sixth grade. And again, sixth grade, I, I, study sync was the ELA resource, but as the Innovative Learning Technology Committee looked at it, they decided that there are enough technology integrations already there. Uh, there's some really cool technology blasts and that sort of thing. So for this similar project, they instead decided to focus on social studies. What the mapping is one of the most important slash bloodiest battles. Pick that example. I know you know the, the killing and the gory stuff, right? But uh, but but I think it's a you know it's a student that understood a historical event really well, was able to explain it in a really creative way, and, and it, you may not be able to pick up on it, but they're actually combining a variety of tools there together. So they, they I think they, they use clips um, to put the video together, and they use Keynote to animate the X's and the circles and, and kind of draw the diagram, and then of course the humor with the sandwich there. So I think the student understood the content really well and was able to create knowledge and share that information with the peers. And I bet if they showed this to the class, they would, under, they would all understand the facts and what happened in that battle better than if they just read it in a textbook. So again, I think uh, a really powerful example of why we put technology in the hands of students. All right. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about our professional learning opportunities that we had last school year. Again, just a, a relatively quick overview. Uh, we had a 60-minute session with Apple Professional Learning on the Institute Day. This is last school year we're going back to. Uh, we had instructional coaches talking about um, 
study sync and benchmark integration. You'll see these building-based professional learning opportunities. These were optional opportunities that were offered at all of our schools. Again, it was important to us that we got them on the calendar early and all the buildings and instructional coaches delivered these. And I think it was fun to see, like, the, uh, you know, these were used a lot. Like, notability is something that, that wasn't used much in the district, the first iteration of the one-to-one -one initiative. It's actually a really powerful app. Um, it's an expensive app that we were able to, to get years ago and, and we still have licensing for. And our students have been using it a lot. And I've seen some really creative students where you see uh, uses with students where they're doing side-by-side -side note taking and things that I didn't even know that you could do. Um, November grade level meetings, we focus on some of the online uh, assessment tools and, and benchmark, some really powerful reporting there. The January grade level meeting is when I talked about the project that you just saw the examples of, where maybe teachers weren't real happy with me, but in the end, I think it was a really positive, uh, <laughs> a really positive experience for us. Uh, kind of moving on, Google Expeditions. Again, we, we focused on a lot of tools this year, and what we struggled with in, in the past, we focused on the learning activities, less on the tools. But last year we said, you know what, let's take a minute and make sure everyone understands what these tools are. Google Expeditions is an augmented reality and virtual reality tool where if you're, if you're learning about the Treaty of Versailles, you know, why just look at a picture of it when you can drop a student into the palace of, of uh, Versailles and look around and see where it was signed and, and, and why not show the student the, the ventricles of a heart with an uh, augmented reality thing. So there's some really powerful ways that they're immersive for students to engage in. Uh, the February Institute Day, we had uh, a session with Apple, and I'll talk a little bit more about Apple in a minute. Uh, and the March grade level meetings, we broke down the AC standards at the grade level. And that was a really great activity for them to get introduced, introduced to those standards. Because um, being a creative communicator means two different things for a kindergartner than it does for a sixth grader. So we're able to really dive into the grade level and talk about those things. Uh, March, again, we did the green screen video. That was that little mosquito thing. That was one example of uh, a green screen. April, we dove into some of the advanced features that we get with Seesaw, in particular what we get with our Seesaw for School subscription. And then May and June, we talked about the Seesaw, uh, what we value. And so we, we kind of thought leading into the next school year, we want to make sure all of our, te all of our teachers, and so principals led this as the instructional leaders of our buildings, uh, they, they led a presentation talking about why, why is it that we're uh, uh, moving forward with this Seesaw initiative, and, and why do we value it, and why is it so important. So here's one slide from that presentation. Uh, so Seesaw, which I think it's good to reiterate with, with the board and the community here, is, is a portfolio of student work. More than anything else, it does a lot of different things, but it, it is a place to gather artifacts of student work. Okay? So it's not just pictures and class events. There's a way to do that, and, and, and we think that's important in Seesaw, too. Uh, it's a great way to, to get parents' attention and send home the, the field trip notices, and, and we want to make sure teachers understand how to use that. But we have it because we, want, we value the power of collecting all the student work over time. And then we also value collecting and sharing it with parents. Again, as I pointed to from our survey data, we have never had much leverage getting the great work that students were doing in front of parents' eyes until we had Seesaw. Uh, and so now parents are able to see what their students, the window in the schools uh, that they didn't have before. And the consistent word is important too. For years, I, I've heard uh, frustrations from parents that this teacher uses that tool and this teacher uses that tool. And, and it, was, it was really challenging. And I know there's still some of that. We, we do want to value our teacher autonomy. Uh, but, but one thing that we can now say consistently at the elementary level is that Seesaw is a uniform platform that all parents can subscribe to and year after year they can go back to that and see their students work. And then finally that idea of student ownership. Again, the research points just so strongly that students, when students take ownership of their work, you're going to get a lot, uh, you're going to get significant gains. Uh, so, so yes, this is absolutely, some, this is, I don't want to act like it's not work or additional burden for teachers, it is, that we're asking teachers to, to, to be a partner in this but we want students to take ownership. This is not something that teachers are doing every day or every week, this is something that students are doing every week. Uh, th they should be taking the ownership, I did something great, maybe I did it on paper, not even with technology, I'm gonna snap a picture of it, I'm gonna put it in Seesaw. Uh, so again, students are taking ownership of their work and reflecting on it and saying, hey, this is something I did that I'm proud of and I want my teacher to see it and I want my parents to see it. Uh, so those are the things that we value about see what Seesaw and uh, that we're so excited uh, to have it. Uh, so jump ahead, and then last video, I promise. Uh, <laughs> So to kind of, that was the end of last year, and to start off this year, uh, we want to, uh, as a, as we, we want to think about how we're going to kick off the Seesaw One to One initiative. Uh, a couple of our, our coaches that participated in a Seesaw Amazing Race activity at, at a conference, so we want to recreate that uh, for our teachers. To one, to give just an exciting opportunity to student get teachers up and out of their seats on opening day, where sometimes there is, unfortunately, uh, a, a lot of sitting, uh, and we also want to model what engaging learning can look like and the four C's, communication, collaboration, creativity. Um, so anyways, so at, uh, on August at Benedictine, we had our amazing race activity, which was a lot of fun. 
on just uh, another my last video here let you see what that was all about Okay, so come here. I'm gonna show you. So the first thing you do, you just tap the plus here, then you go to send an announcement. You say who you're gonna send it to. All families, all students and families, all students. And then you type your announcement in here. The announcement feature, you can upload a weekly newsletter or pictures. I use this for sending home reminders about homework or sending out weekly updates. So student announcements could be don't forget your permission slip, we're having a field trip, library day is tomorrow, bring in your book, lots of fun stuff like that. Again, it was a, I think it was a fun day, a fun, a fun part of the day, I should say, and I think we were trying to model the type of activities that you could do with your students, getting people up and out of their seats, being creative, and, and, uh, and also learning about the tool. So that was, an, I think, an exciting start to our Seesaw professional learning for the year. A little bit more about the plans for the rest of the year. Uh, you know, it was our first full year implementation, as I've said a few times. We want to focus on the idea of student ownership. Um, Apple professional learning. Uh, you know, this is where I have to be honest. We, we've struggled a little bit with Apple professional learning. I, I, for those of you that, that were on the board, you may recall uh, with the purchase of the iPads, it, it came with uh, some hours of professional learning. And we've tried to take advantage of that, I think, with some mixed results. Um, I, I think part of it has depended on you know, the, who, who's coming in from Apple. We've had some really good presenters. And like in one room across the hall, people are not very happy because we've had presenters not been doing a good job. And, and so uh, on, on the 19th, we tried to take advantage of in a situation where our coaches are busy working with the Amazing Race, our teachers are all taking part in science learning, and so we tried to, to leverage that Apple professional learning. And, and I'll be honest, I don't know that it went as well as I'd hoped, which, which is frustrating. Uh, so, so we're going to continue to think about how we want to utilize them. And also, uh, while we want to take advantage of that resource, we also don't want to sacrifice our very valuable professional learning time with our teachers. Uh, if we can't guarantee the outcome or, or be more uh, optimistic about the outcome. Uh, we do have an assistive technology project that we're working on with Apple uh, to try to help our teachers, all, all of our teachers and students, learn about the assistive technology features on iPads because there's some really uh, powerful things there. Uh, the creative tools component is something that we did on, on opening day with uh, some features in Keynote. Um, There'll be a, a, some benchmark inquiry projects that we'll be talking about with our uh, partnering our Innovative Learning and Technology Committee with our teacher librarians. Uh, we'll continue to integrate with TCI and iQuest. So there's a lot of good technology integration built in there. And as always, that, the last bullet point is our most effective uh, method of professional learning, I believe, is that job, and, uh, job embedded professional learning. We've got four instructional coaches uh, that, that carve out their time and, and move between all 13 buildings and work closely <coughs> with teachers to support them on whatever it is they may need support. So that is all I have. I know uh, that was long, but thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'll open any questions that you may have. Any questions? I'll just start off with a, not so much a question, but just a statement. Um, this is a, a a body of work. First of all, just thanks for the great presentation and uh, exhaustive research that you, you put into it and, and, and the time spent. Um, 
this is not, a, for me, this is not a question of if we should be doing this, but more a question of how do we make it better? Um, and so uh, I think the like binary of are we a one-to-one -one district or are we not a one-to-one -one district is uh, not the question that I'm asking um, and not the question that I'm hearing from uh, people that uh, are, are coming up to talk to me about it. Um, and I, looking at this over the last 18 months that I've, I've been in this seat, um, just the evolution of how we're thinking about how does this tie directly into the work we do as a teaching and learning institution? Uh, just, I, I love seeing this evolution. Uh, I, lo I, I love the idea of uh, integrating into our curriculum in meaningful ways. Um, and there's always ways we can get better, uh, and that's what people should be pushing us to be doing. Uh, but just appreciate the shift in continuing to evolve towards it being an integrated part of our curriculum versus another part of our teaching day that happens to be technology. Uh, uh, the integrated part just makes a lot more sense to me, and I'm starting to see how that's uh, coming to coming through in the how we in how we talk about it. And so I just appreciate the uh, the work that's gone into it. I agree. Thank you, Krat. Um So have being here for the last two plus years, um, I kind of feel in a different a different place. Um, well, except I do agree with everything that you said. Um, I want to see, both as a parent and a board member, I want to see not why anymore. Again, I, I think they're here. And how we choose to use them and all that, um, I feel uh, from a year ago sitting here, so much better about um, the teacher and the training and all of that stuff. I would like to see, um, over the next year is figuring out how we assess and spend more on the um, the how and the what and then when. How are we assessing these, I love the standards. How are we assessing that my child is learning that from that K through eight? I, I at this point, not. I don't care if my kid is using it once a month for this or I think as a parent that I'm engaged weekly or monthly, I want to know what they're learning. I want to know that they, she understands what being a digital citizen is. I want to know more with the, those benchmark inquiry projects. That I think is, I don't think we need to know the why anymore because we approved it two years ago and now we need to know what are they learning every year. At the, at the end of the kindergarten, is a child knowing how to charge, it sounds a little kind of funny, but um, how to log in, because I do remember that that was one thing Mrs. Pataki wanted the kids to know by the end of the year, because early on, logging in with those numbers and memorizing those weird things was, so knowing that going into first grade, Samantha could log in on her own. Good, that's what I want. I want her to know specifically what she's learning, and however, I'm not sure how we assess that, um, I don't know if there's things out there. Um, I love seeing it all being tied in. I again from a year ago where we were, or even um, you know from from the vote. Um, but now I want to see, and I want us to find out what the kids are learning specific. And again, I don't know how to do that. Um, but I don't care anymore about why. I want to know what what. Um, and if it's something that we test at the beginning of the year or just at the end of the year, I, again, I don't know the when and I don't know the how. <laughs> but as the board member, I do get to ask. So. Absolutely. Um, but I, that's what I want to see is then how is that all then, and then following that K through eight and knowing that when my kid is in eighth grade, she goes into high school and she knows just from playing at home, but within the school that she knows what she's learning because um, I think they're doing it, but I want to know that she knows what she's learning, and that's what I'm most interested at this point. Um, I think, you know, if we go from iPads to Chromebooks or whatever, that's, you know, those are the logistical things, but I think we're, we're done with the why I need to go to the, the how and the, and the what. Julie, you're talking about technical curriculum, like, it kind sounds of. like some of the stuff you're talking about kind is of. not necessarily how they're doing in, in straight curriculum on technology, but Correct. what, on top of that, what yes. technical components they should yes. learn 
yes. from the time that by, yes. by the time they're done with first grade or sixth yes. grade or eighth grade and or whatever. They okay. know what they're learning because I don't think they know necessarily that they're because it it is a tool. I feel like like what you talked about and with his seven, they, you know, that's just a part of learning. I want to see that almost be another its curriculum. Own curriculum. But okay. not, but not. <laughs> <laughs> teachers not. But <laughs> you know, not that. But that. I don't know if I'm 100 percent clear. So thanks for. Um, but again, I I want to know that she's learning how to use it in the best way possible to raise her grades, to become an innovative thinker, to to do that. You know, I see her doing all these awesome things, but I want her to understand where that all lies, the learning, and learning and how she's going to learn, use that in the future. And how are they going to use all this as a skill to make them successful in middle school and high school? Because I think that's, you know, now that we've got, because again, from a year ago, just the, all the, the different professional learning and how you guys are tying things into curriculum, I think we are right on the right path. Um, with all of that, and it has shifted thinking, so that is fantastic. Um, and I know it's a lot of work, but I think I, I need to know what the nitty gritty is at this point. Thank, thank you. you. James, um, first of all, thank you so much for this. I think the presentation was excellent from someone who was not here when this was, uh, the refresh was approved last time. This was very helpful for me to understand a little bit more about of how that all came about and works and how the technology is used and, and all that kind of stuff it's definitely was a great presentation very informative for me um, I certainly understand and value and agree with the idea of our students need to be prepared for technology learning technology to be part of our global ever-changing world that is a very important part of their education and I think that we need to place emphasis and value on it um, I think, however, though, I'm a little bit more um, skeptical, especially at the elementary level, whether those goals couldn't be achieved um, without necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, it's very expensive to provide that for students, and I think that something to think about, at least for me, would be could we accomplish those same goals without having one-to-one -one and potentially, you know, given our budget constraints and concerns in the coming years and our need for um, funding in a lot of other areas, could we potentially prioritize in different ways and, and still meet the technology goals while not necessarily using one-to-one? -one? Looking at some of the um, parent responses in the survey, um, especially in the comment section, there was a lot of discussion from a lot of parents about how often the technology is used, how the technology is used, and how that varies from teacher to teacher, school to school still. And um, for me, I'm just a little concerned about that. Do we, um, you know, how are they being used? How often are they being used? Do we need to possibly rethink the priorities given that we have a lot of other areas that need to be looked at and where money is going to need to be spent in the coming year. So I, I value the technology. I think what you're doing is great. I think the teachers are doing an excellent job of incorporating it and learning more about how to use it more effectively. Um, but I'm a little bit more skeptical, especially in the younger grades, as to is this necessarily something that we should be pushing really, really hard on. I'm learning more and I'm, I'm just, I have a little bit more of a skeptical viewpoint. So. But I appreciate your. I thought it was a great presentation. Learned a tremendous amount, and it was great. So. Thank you. Thank you. Your push for in the earlier grades to do instead of a one to one, a multiple to one, as opposed to no access to technology. Yes. Oh, I'm absolutely nothing. No access. For, definitely not. But just I don't know that we need to have a one to one to meet the goals that we're talking about. Like a lot of the things that I felt like a lot of the things that were mentioned throughout the presentation could have still been done without necessarily each student having their own iPad to take home every day. You know, I think that potentially you could just have a multiple student to iPad ratio and achieve the same goals and do the same projects and those types of things. I, I mean, I, I can't say one of the pieces of feedback that we, we got, and we looked at that last time around, and one of the, the challenges that we'll have to, to figure out moving forward is just the, the logistical aspect of it. 
for the teachers. I, I just mm -hmm. science. I mean, it's almost to, to the point that, that Jill brought up. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what our kindergarten teachers are struggling with being two to one is is they're using them less, or it's harder to use them as frequently because students have to sign in and they have to sure. sign out and they can't just pick up their iPad and practice on IXL or go into RAS Kids and read a book sure. or even Seesaw. So that, that, no, absolutely that, understandable. That, that is one of the, through, the, the sure. challenges that we have. But, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for the presentation. As uh, a newcomer to the board, but having been a, a regular attendee at board meetings for the last four years, um, I see, um, I guess I'm a little disappointed, but hopeful that moving forward with new science, curriculum, social studies, math, and so on, that we would see more than once in a while, um, once, more than once a month working with a, a, a project with a friend, um, and hoping that these Monday prof professional development days um, are giving teachers access or collaborating on how to integrate the technology, not just using it to use TCI for social studies and read your, instead of a textbook, right. because I, I, that doesn't mean anything to me. It's more about integrating and showing the projects like you just showed. And it's a very expensive thing to have, to have, so it's, a, it's slightly disappointing when you see that it's only once, once a month for a project, so that seems like a growth opportunity here to start figuring out we need to have more than once a month for a kid to work together on a project or make a multimedia assignment. And I'm hopeful with all the new curriculum coming out that not only we're not just using it as another medium instead of a textbook, but actually to use it and integrate it and learn and make something at the same time rather than just using it as an alternative to a textbook. So I'm hoping those Mondays will turn, turn some of these numbers around. I, um, I, I had the same question that you did, Tracy, about that slide. Um, that would be slide 17. And, um, you know, James, you mentioned in your presentation that it might be time to, to reword some of these questions. I think that one is, is prime for rewording, just like the word project. I think that... that Maybe I'm totally reading this wrong, and that, that's, that's perfectly um, possible, but I just, you know, project to me might be something different than, than project to another student, if I'm answering that question. I mean, um, does, it, does this indicate that our students are only collaborating uh, once a month? Potentially, but if you, I, if you I, this makes sense what I'm saying, like, if you think of a project as something big, and your, your report on, on the state of Illinois or something like that, that you spend multiple weeks working on in class, that might be a once a month thing, but if, if, if Karad and I are, are, are reading a text and we're coming up with a, a summary to present to the class or we are, we're solving some kind of science problem together using our, our technology, I might just say that's a homework assignment or a class assignment, not, not necessarily a project. But that was my one thought. But you could per perfectly be right about that. Um, my um, notice and wonder is related to, to slide 19. Um, and if you put that in front of me, um, you know, if I was, if I'm on the, if I'm on the board in the future, that if you want to, that's fine. Yeah. Um, it's, oh, no, it's, no, it's, no. it's the one about schoolwork has been more interesting since we started using our, our one-to-one um, mm -hmm. iPads. Um, you put that 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 in front of me in front of um, uh, a vote on on a, a refresh in the future. Um, Ninety percent of students saying that they find their work more interesting to me is is everything I need to know to support a refresh. Um, the one opportunity, and and again, I, I see limitations with this because um, it's difficult to, to, collect, to collect meaningful student voice from kindergartners through second graders. So all we have here is third through eight, um, to, to Emily's point. Um, you know, trying to figure out the need for um, one to one at the, at the elementary level. Um, but my, my, my two cents here is this is a celebration. This 90% figure that, that um, our students are finding that they're they're more engaged and they're more motivated and more enthusiastic about their learning um, because of the iPads. Um, you know, as a board, we've been talking a lot lately about class sizes as as just one of the many things that that's going to impact student growth and achievement. And um, while you know we could we could spend a lot of time talking about how that impacts growth and growth and achievement, one thing I'm, I'm unequivocally certain of is, is motivation is going to have a much um, greater impact on, 
on my child's growth and, uh, and achievement, your children and the children of all of our of our community. If if they if they come to school and they're excited to learn and they want to keep going and, and getting and getting better with their skills, we're gonna we're gonna see um, greatness in, in our classrooms. Um, so I, I am curious about your point, though, Emily, about how we, what do we do at the lowest levels. Um, so I don't know how to, how to gather that information on, on how those students feel about whether or not a one-to-one -one is, is, is as impactful for them. Um, but certainly it's something I'd be curious to learn more about. Um, I just think that you know, you know, one thing we need to be talking about as a board is um, you know, it's, it's impossible for us to understand really the direct impact that this is having on, on our student outcomes. There's so many other factors. I mean, we just talked about class sizes, but, but, but if we see a, um, an uptick in our, in our IAR data, is that because of iPads? Maybe. We won't be able to isolate that. It could be, it could be a number of things. It could be our, our, our new curriculum. It could be our, our excellent teachers. It could be a whole number of things. Um, but the Monday collaboration time. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, absolutely. We're changing a lot so we're, of we're never going right? to be able to to show the community like mm -hmm. we we we've we've increased growth achievement by this much because we spent 1.4 1.5 million dollars last year um, over the course of, of, of several years. Um, but and now I just lost my my point. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so but the one thing we need to remember is that the Chromebooks it, it's it's not it's not some kind of magic spell that's gonna make our achievement gonna get, um, and growth improve. It's, it's all that we're teaching our teachers how to do with it. And you mentioned goal setting, you mentioned collaboration, and those things are gonna have um, an impact on growth and achievement. Um, the, the ability, and, and this is what, you, what I was thinking about when you were talking is, you know, my, my first grader, if they have Chromebooks, or sorry, uh, iPads in their classroom, like the ability to differentiate and put, put um, uh, some kind of, um, uh, some text in front of my my daughter that she's going to find interesting that's going to help her um, you know engage better with the standards and but Darren's daughter is also in first grade might have different just interests and just like the, the, all the things our teachers can do differentiate goal set collaborate formatively assess all those things that we know because research tells us are going to be is going to be impactful on on our student outcomes that's the thing that we like we need to be thinking about as as a board is um, looking for evidence that Kevin and, and James and the team can deliver us about how we are changing um, classroom practices from the adults and how, that's, how we're seeing that in, in all of our buildings and how that's going to, um, how, you know, how we can see like, tangible evidence that we are, we're getting stronger in instruction and, and curriculum because of, of, the, of the technology. And that's, that's what really um, makes me enthusiastic as a board member and somebody who is really pleased for the presentation and to see, you know, um, what we've done, but certainly I, I just, I'll, I'll stop talking, but I just, that, that 90% to me, that's awesome, and that's huge, and I, I, I'm really glad to see it jump by 10 points in the last year, and hopefully we can, we can maintain that and increase that. Thank you. Well, first and foremost, I want to say um, thank you for kind of following the direction that you heard from us last time, and in showing us regular work as opposed to some of the extra stuff that was getting done. It, it was nice to really see, I, I know it was a lot to watch, I know it was a long presentation, but what was really nice to see what was uniform as opposed to maybe what was different or exciting. Look at this great project this one class did. It was nice to see, look at what's common amongst our, our classrooms. I, I think that was great. Um, I know it started with one main objective, we're all going to do at least one of, one of these, and it was social studies for sixth grade and one through five, it, you know, but, but it's, it, it's setting those sparks, I think, and every year, one of those things, it, it's, it's hard to get over that initial hump and learn how to do it and learn how to teach it, but it, at some point, once you have it, um, I found that in the last couple, in just in the last couple of years, right, I, I had teachers trying out and they were doing one thing, and now you're seeing that pop up two, three, or four projects like that, because it doesn't take a week to do that kind of project. They're, they're spending a little bit of time on it. So I, I think that's really good. Uh, I think that what you're hearing uniformly across the board is we like the trajectory. We want to see more. We want to continue to see uh, more data here. We want to see that we're using technology um, 
to solve problems as they're coming up, like we're finding those gaps and we're using the tool sets that we have. Uh, I'd like to continue to see us being more and more uniform. Uh, the fact that I have multiple kids and they're both in Seesaw and they're both using that for announcements and they're posting on there, there's consistency as a parent. Um, that makes my life a lot easier. I know where to go, I know where to look. And as we saw from the strategic plan, communication is such a big uh, component of what we're working for. So um, I think that that's fantastic. I want to engage you just for a second on the one-to-one -one versus maybe multi-to-one. And I had a unique experience uh, in our school because before we did the refresh, our kindergarten classroom had one-to-one -one iPads. Um, and I went out and I helped out in that classroom. And then I went out and helped out last year in when my other daughter was in kindergarten. And it was completely night and day because they would break into groups and they would grab their iPad and they would just start working. And I was there purely to help everyone get started. And by the time they were getting in and doing some of their technical exercises, we were moving on to their, their next station. So I, I think that where I've seen when I've had the opportunity to go into the classroom um, for my children, the benefit that I like is there's not technology time where we're all breaking away and we're using technology. It's like how I pull out like a calculator in my office or pull out something. They're working on something and an aspect of that has to be the iPad and they pull that out and they work with it for 10 minutes and then they, they slide it back into their desk and they continue on. Um, I think that's what makes one-to-one -one powerful. If all we're doing is having, we're gonna do a project and so we're, you know, we used, to, you know, we used to back in the day do that in the computer lab and we could still do it that way. The idea is I think being able to, how are we integrating that a little bit you know, every day, and, and how is it just one of the tools that we have in our toolbox? So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing to see how we, we do that consistently, I think, across our, our classroom. So thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Listed on tonight's agenda are 11 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? With that, then we'll start with the reports to the board, and we'll start with Dr. Russell. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just a couple of updates from curriculum instruction. As you know, the new science curriculum is being implemented, as well as the math pilot. Um, things are going smoothly to start the school year. However, um, one of the things as an ASC team that we've identified with the help of our teachers and support staff is while the overwhelming majority of our materials were ready to go in technology devices, um, we want to let our teachers know and, and the community know that we hear you that our expectation is all the materials are ready to go. And you know, as an administrative team, we certainly own that and we're going to continue to get better at that. So all of our teachers have all the materials on day one. So I want to thank our staff for starting the year off so strong. And um, you've got our commitment to making sure that we do better at that next school year, even though I, I do feel like it was a, a fairly decent job. Um, we can always do better, and we will certainly do that. So thank you to our teachers for all of their hard work and our support staff as well. Want to highlight early release Mondays. The district has spent a lot of time. I'm looking over at Mr. Sissel here, and uh, he's done a great job really spearheading this and, and organizing it. And we do have some feedback, and uh, he was crunching the numbers in between uh, this evening in, in preparation for the board meeting. So thank you, Justin, for putting those together. Uh, want to give you some uh, just quick feedback on the first two. This is something that we're very closely monitoring. We know that this is a huge commitment from the Board of Education and from our community. We thank our community members, especially our parents. Um, I am a parent of early release as well, and I know that it is not the easiest thing to navigate, so we want to thank all of our parents. Here's the feedback that we've got so far. Um, so on a five-point scale, one being not really valuable or productive and five being extremely valuable, um, when we asked our teachers how valuable was today's professional learning, 98% responded in the three to five range with 86 in the four to five range. So that's pretty good. Um, how relevant was today's professional learning to your role? 97% were in the three to five, 87% were in the four to five. How productive was today's professional learning? 97% were in the three to five, 90% were in the four to five. When asked when do you, uh, when do you feel today's professional learning will have an impact on your students? 80% said immediately or within the next week, while an additional 10% said within the next month. So those are just some initial numbers. Um, 
but those are pretty strong numbers. Uh, being a former teacher, I know I was always stingy on those survey numbers to, to put that out. So we really want to thank our administrators at the building level and our teachers at the building level for really making these things come alive. And uh, we certainly appreciate all the extra effort. Under finance, I want to thank Todd Drayfall for putting together a balanced budget. Um, that's a lot of hard work. I, I know sometimes at a board meeting like this, you might not see any questions by the end of this, but I, I do always like to remind the community that you know we had a budget workshop in the spring. We work on the budget all summer long, a tentative budget, another budget hearing, or excuse me, another budget workshop earlier uh, this month, and now um, here we are at the final product. So it's a lot of uh, effort, a lot of team effort, so thank you, Todd. I also want to remind our community of just how tight that budget is. Um, one of the things that we are going to strive for as we come into the uh, upcoming school year is to create a little more cushion uh, for two reasons. First, we need to provide money for contingencies. Um, you never know what's going to happen at the start of the school year for facilities or class size or you know, uh, uh, um, more students coming in. And right now, our rainy day fund is about as low as it can get. And, and I think we really need to provide for contingencies. One of the other things that we have to provide more cushion is our fund balances. We need to continue to grow our fund balances so we don't even have to have conversations about potential tax anticipation warrants or reliance on the state for state aid as we're waiting for our June tax receipts. We want to make sure that we you know, really protect the school district and that was something that we discussed at length at the last budget workshop so I wanted to fill in the community that is something that we are definitely looking to do. I also want to update on the facility, uh, Kim, uh, excuse me, the Finance Advisory Committee. One of the things that we're doing is we're looking to put that committee also on board docs and other board uh, committees for transparency so the community can follow along with us and also for the members to have access to that information. So I know the board president, myself, and Melissa <laughs> are working hard on that and that's something that we hope to have up uh, very soon. With the start of the school year, one of the facilities things that often gets overlooked by um, the community, but I know we all appreciate these people, are our custodian crews and our maintenance crews. They did an outstanding job uh, getting our schools ready. I've had the opportunity to go through all 13 of our schools, and I wanted to make sure that we took the time tonight to really recognize all of our custodians and our maintenance crew, uh, the job that they do to prepare our schools over the summer. If you've ever had the opportunity to walk through a school in the summer and you can see all the stuff leaving the classrooms and then getting back in there, uh, want to give them a big shout out for the, the job that they did. Um, they are the unsung heroes of our school district and uh, they did a tremendous job getting everything uh, together. I have received several uh, inquiries or concerns about the lack of air conditioning in uh, the majority of our schools. I, I don't think that's a surprise to everyone. As a former teacher in District 58, I can say that I often shared that concern as well. But whenever I get a lot of concerns as a superintendent, of course, I like to uh, make sure at a public meeting that we let our citizens know and our taxpayers know that we hear you. And I also want to um, highlight that in our draft master facility plan, that is a big piece of our second bucket, so to speak, where we're talking about indoor air quality and other things in our school. In terms of public relations this year, one of the things that we are working very hard on this year is to reconnect uh, with community groups. There are several different community groups within our school district. PTAs are a great example of that. But then also outside of our school district, uh, the Village of Downers Grove, the Economic Development Corporation, the Rotary Club, the Lions Club, and the Grove Foundation. The list can go on and on and on. Uh, the Education Foundation is another big one. One of the things that we're committed to is to reconnecting and continuing our strong bonds with these community groups. Um, I know the Board of Education is really committed to that. Uh, the administrative team is committed to that, and our teachers have also. And so I want to thank everyone for reconnecting with the community because I think we'd all agree that the stronger our ties are in District 58 with all these organizations, the better environment we're going to have for our students and staff. So that is a big priority that we have as a school district, and it's also um, a priority in our strategic plan under goal number two, connecting with the community. In terms of personnel, one of the things that we've been um, also hearing some concerns about are class sizes. Um, the majority of the class size concerns uh, were coming from pockets inside of our school district, uh, El Sierra, for example, with their, with their primary grades. Uh, but we also hear concerns uh, you know, throughout the district in terms of class size whenever those numbers start to get in the high 20s and things like that. Um, Recently, we've been hearing after curriculum nights concerns about math. Remember, our school district is a district that in third grade starts to give kids different blueprints depending on their readiness. So some third graders may start to take uh, fourth grade math and fifth grade math and so on and so forth. And one of the things that we do see year in after year is when you have community schools or neighborhood schools, 
and you offer a variety of math levels, um, that can, can cause stress on the school building in terms of class size and how that's going to work with our teachers. So whether we're talking about class sizes in general, whether we're talking about specifically for math, one of the things that I want to um, encourage community members that they have concerns in this area is to please contact your building principal. And the administrative staff at the district office will also come and work with our teams to ensure that we provide the best opportunity for our kids. Now, of course, we do have tight budgets and the neighborhood school concept does create some challenges in this area. That being said, we are committed to making sure that all of our students get a quality math experience or a quality overall experience and to make sure that even though that number may be large, how do we utilize all staff effectively in our buildings to really shrink that down to give kids as many touch points as possible and, and to build their understanding in that given uh, subject area. I want to thank our building principals, Mr. Sissel, uh, Jane Uzentis, for really working hard on that to continue to work with them, but we will continue to meet um, until we get all of those issues resolved and also it's something that we constantly monitor throughout the school year. So is the plan that we put forth in August or September still having effect in October, in April, in May? So this isn't something that we just cross off the list at the start of the year. We are constantly monitoring all of that. Just as a reminder, there are two reports as well available online. Um, Per school code regulation, six days after the budget's passed, we have to post the IMRF compensation report. So that's the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund. That's basically all of our employees who are not in the teacher's retirement system, administrators and teachers. So that has been posted. And also the teacher and administration compensation report has to be posted by October 1st. The district has also um, complied with that. And you will see that report. Now that one is for last year. The reason that's for last year is that makes sure that all the administrators, that they have vacation days and things like that, that all gets counted in. Um, but the IMRF one is current. Why is that that way? That's the way the law is written under school code. <laughs> and uh, that being said, though, if anyone were to ever have any questions about compensation or anything, all of these are public salaries, and um, you know that information is easily accessible. I want to take some time to just uh, talk about a couple of other things that popped up. Um, for our O'Neill community, there was an incident uh, yesterday that um, we had a very vague post on social media, and it was um, basically telling a student not to come to school today. Um, when we receive posts like that, I want you to know that District 58 and the village of Downers Grove and the police force in Downers Grove take anything like that very seriously. Even though we were able to determine very quickly that it was not a credible threat, I think many of us in the room are parents and we understand just how serious anything like that is in 2019. And I want to reassure the community that the district takes everything extremely seriously. I'm so grateful for the police department for their partnership. Um, we mobilized our entire district last evening and the police did the same thing as well to ensure that all of our students would arrive safely with no issues and I'm very pleased to report that's exactly what happened. We communicated with our O'Neill families last night. Again, I want to stress that it was not a credible threat, but I still want to make sure that everyone understands whether it's credible or not. We treat it as if it were, um, and then we make sure that we partner with the police and we work in conjunction with our police department. So I do want to take this opportunity to thank the O'Neill administration, uh, our board president, I know he was speaking with me yesterday as well, and uh, the Downers Grove Police Department for just a really nice job of, of making sure that we had a safe environment for our students today. Uh, the Health and Wellness Committee was inadvertently left off tonight's agenda for an update. Um, while the committee hasn't met, that will be a standing item on future agendas. We do have a committee meeting coming up, so that will be uh, on the next board agenda and there will be a full report for that. Some upcoming events. To conclude my report, we have Oktoberfest from the Education Foundation this Friday evening and Saturday all day and then into Saturday evening. I know our Education Foundation would certainly appreciate any volunteers, so if you're able to do that, uh, please consider it. Uh, they have a very easy sign-up system online. Um, all that money comes directly back to the students of District 58. It's a really great opportunity for us to come together as a community and to give back to our students. Um, Columbus Day, I know this is hard to talk about already because it still feels like we're in summer mode, but that's coming up on October 14th and I highlight that because that would be the regularly scheduled board meeting that we would have in October since that is a day off. Um, by law, school boards can't meet on days off, not that I think anybody wanted to on a day off, so uh, our board meeting is going to be on Wednesday, October 16th, so that will be a change. So I'd just like to remind everybody to put a little mark on their calendar so uh, no one misses that. 
That concludes my superintendent's report. And again, the school year is off and running to a great start. And I want to thank everyone for their support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, on to monthly business with Mr. Drayfall. I think I already had my time with the budget, so I will be very, very brief. Um, every year to date report, this is always a flux time. Uh, if you look at this current year uh, compared to what the average is in the last four, you'll see that revenue is up um, comparative to the previous years. That's just because of calendar when taxes come in. Um, this year, last year, we had taxes come in in April. Um, the couple of years before that, we had taxes come in the first part of September. So you always have that differential in there, and, and that's why that, that piece is in, looks a little bit higher. Um, those things kind of level themselves out over the next month or so. Um, there was no wellness committee meeting, but I do want to thank uh, the uh, DGEEA uh, during uh, the Institute Day uh, that we had with all the uh, certified staff. Uh, we had an opportunity to go in and talk to every group, every, every building group for about 10 or 15 minutes about insurance and about some things. And, and we kind of split it up between um, uh, some of their members and ours to talk about and cover just some of the basics of benefits pieces and to, you know, let them know of what things are coming and, and about the wellness committee and so forth. So I want to thank them for that. Um, you have, and, and if you hit update, you have in your uh, monthly re report a, a short memo or a memo on uh, ESSA numbers. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act that was approved in 2015 uh, requires every uh, state to report uh, to the federal government um, expenditure by building. And this is the first time we're doing that. Um, so that is just your base numbers of what we have submitted uh, to the state. That will show up at the October report card information that comes out. It's going to be slightly different than previous years. Uh, in previous years, when they put out performance, uh, student performance uh, by building, they, uh, the expenditures were always about two years before that because they only used audited numbers, and the audits don't come in to the state until November, December, and January in some cases. So that's a shift uh, that will happen. But we wanted just to make you aware of some of that base information that we have submitted uh, to the state at the end of, at the end of August. Um, other than that, you also have, there's an update to the year-to-date report we talked about a little bit last month that does have that medical reserve fund. And you'll see that going forward is, is where that's at currently, uh, you, which is in the Treasury report, always has been. But then we're going to compare it to uh, last year at this time and uh, two years prior at that time. So uh, with that, if there are any questions um, on the year-to-date monthly reports. Thank you. Thank you. Under the policy committee, which did not meet in August, the legislative committee did not meet in August. So we're to the financial advisory committee. Um, we'll go ahead and report on that to start. We started off our meeting. We did have a little bit of a conversation about moving to a more archival process for keeping our documents, something like board docs, where we would keep that and post that for our group and then have that book be archived and also just as a way to access in advance. Uh, so we're doing a little research on that. Uh, we always start off our meeting uh, reviewing the year-to-date reports and that kind of piece, and we also spend a time going over the final budget in preparation uh, for this meeting. We did spend a little bit of time talking about the way we do cash management and some of the opportunities that we have in, in doing little things like the, the MRF fund, which was primarily in a checking account. Um, we said, why are we doing that when we can actually make some interest in a money market account? So we are only keeping the money in the checking account that would actually be money that we're going to spend um, sometime soon. The rest of it is in an interest-bearing account. So um, when you look at the year-to-date report, that's why now you're seeing some interest coming in there that you weren't uh, previously seeing. Um, next month, you're going to see a resolution to authorize a new vendor for us to do investments. Obviously, um, 
we have limited abilities to do investments here because we have to pick quite safe solutions and so we have to we follow a, a significant amount of guidelines. We can't just go out and buy a bunch of Facebook stock because Karat has a hunch. Uh, so, um, but, so ultimately we're looking at a, a company called PFM that maybe in some of the CDs and investments that we would do would have a, uh, a savings of about 10 basis points for us. Uh, so that would be good. This isn't something that would immediately just kind of slam over or whatever. This would be as we go to purchase more um, items, we could, we could uh, utilize their tool. We can always continue to use um, our, our current vendor as well, PMA. But that is something that you're going to start seeing coming. And primarily a lot of this investment, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is primarily done over the, s the summer months. Um, right now, by the time we pass this through, we're going to start needing the majority of this money so we're not getting into it. And most of this stuff right now is really short-term investments anyways because of, of the current state of the, the yield curve. Um, stuff along those lines. Uh, obviously, pretty much right around the corner here, we're going to be looking at the um, uh, tax rates, uh, the, the, where the CPI stands and, and all that kind of stuff um, coming up next month and, and pretty much uh, you can celebrate, I guess, that the, the 20 budget is over, but you get to start on the, the 21 budget uh, <laughs> tomorrow. Month. Yeah. So uh, we also talked a little bit about the fact that the General Assembly passed a bill for some capital funds to come in. No bonds have been issued as part of that yet, so we're not necessarily counting on that money just yet, but it is in our budget. Of, it's, uh, we have a number in there of 1.7 million. If you looked on that, you'll see that it's 1.7 million coming in, 1.7 million coming out. Um, but we talked long and hard about uh, one of the gentlemen on the Financial Advisory Committee uh, is on the committee raising money for playgrounds and he's like, well, you know, what should we be planning for with this? And the truth is right now we're like, I, I don't know. Until they actually issue us a check, it's hard for us to, to actually um, commit to anything uh, with that. Spent time looking over the ESSA report and the fact that no look the way that they do because every building has some unique circumstances. Some buildings might have less efficient heating, some buildings might have air conditioning, some buildings might have more tenured teachers, uh, but in general um, we have a pretty, pretty uniform uh, distribution across the board. And, uh, and then you've already sort of addressed the Health and Wellness Committee, but next month we will see a um, recommended increase normally in the past. We've always set the rate on our fiscal year budget, where starting in July would be when the, the rate kicks in for insurance. Starting with calendar year 20, we are going to be moving to a January through December for that rate. The reason being is that's the dates that they actually pick their plan for. So um, in October and November, they'll be picking their plans for next calendar year. So we are going to get on a rotation of doing that. With that, we had a 9.9% increase last year. Uh, for you know, for this, we set it for this current fiscal year starting in July, but we are going to make another adjustment here. We've budgeted as high as 14% total for the year. So if you take that nine, our, for our fiscal year, you take 9.9%, that would mean we have the ability within our budget to go as high as 8%, but it probably will not be um, that high. Um, and with that, I will conclude my report unless you have something additional to add. No, I, I thought it was a very healthy um, discussion. I think we should try to encourage that increased dialogue that we had, you know, I think from administrators, board members, and community members. I thought we had a really healthy dialogue, and I just think that we just need to stress that going forward. So I thought it was a fantastic meeting, and I hope all are like that in the future. Thank you. The district leadership did meet on August the 27th, and with that, it was sort of the kickoff of the year um, and getting everything going. So we sort of reviewed where we ended up last year and hitting, and where we were in hitting the goals, and sort of uh, reviewed where we're going to go next year. And I know that Dr. Russell would sort of like to do a, a brief overview of what we talked about in that meeting. I think for the community, um, one of the things that I would like you to know is that for the district leadership team. That is really the vehicle that we use to monitor our progress with the strategic plan. So for instance, in goal number one, we spent a lot of time talking about the curriculum, where we're at with the curriculum, um, from everywhere from science to math to technology, um, what progress are we making, and then 
Also, that would be the goal where we're looking at those key performance indicators and seeing how our students are achieving. So every time we get testing data in, we're certainly taking a look at that. Goal number two is connecting with the community. And connecting with the community is not just what I was talking about before, about you know building those relationships. That, that's obviously a key part. That's something we really, really find important. But it's also taking a look at some of the things that we hear from our community, like equity across all of our schools. What does class size look like? How are we doing in this particular area? So um, some of uh, Dr. Uzentis' work when you look at, um, you know, equity across all our schools and the resources review committee, that falls under uh, strategic goal number two and something that we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at this year and coming back as we discussed last time about some recommendations to the school board when we look at class size and when we look at what does math acceleration look like in all of our schools. And then of course we spent a great deal of time on goal three. And goal three is the facilities in, in securing the future for our building. Um, why we love our schools, our schools are aging. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I often share at our meetings is um, our youngest school, El Sierra, just had its 50th birthday. A and so I think we'd all agree that 50 is not necessarily young. And so there are a lot of facility demands that we have. Um, so over the next several months, we're going to talk about this in, in a few moments here as a Board of Education, but it's something that the district leadership team spent a lot of time talking about. What does that process look like? There was a lot of work done from the Facility Planning Council. Members of that council were there at the district leadership team, um, making sure that their work wouldn't just be thrown aside in a community engagement process. And, and that is certainly not something that any of us would want to do. We, we use that work to really start that community engagement process where the rubber meets the road. So we did spend a lot of time talking about the next step of that draft master facility plan and what does it look like to get to the final master facility plan. And I thought, um, like Member Olchek just talked about the financial advisor committee, the district leadership team was really a nice, robust conversation, a lot of give and take. Uh, I know, uh, Member Weiner, you were there as well, and I thought it was just a really nice dialogue and left me thinking, which is exactly what we want to do when we go to those meetings. So um, I thought it was very, very well done. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, is there anything you'd like to add? No, it was a great start to the year. Great. Thank you. Well, with that, then we'll go on to our, our discussion items for the night. We have one item here, and that is the third party consultant for community and engagement process. Is everybody up here on the dais will remember last month we had uh, a discussion item or we actually had an action item for this to to say that we were going to move forward with uh, a consultant named Paul Hanley due to the recommendation from the administration since that recommendation happened um, some changes have happened to uh, Paul's employment so I figured Dr. Russell may want to give us a quick update on that and I wanted us to have an opportunity to have a larger discussion around this um, and then decide what our next steps are going to be moving forward. And I, and I appreciate the, um, the time to talk to the community and, and talk to the full board. Um, one of the things that um, every board, in, including this board, really um, puts a huge emphasis on is transparency and wanting to make sure that our community is completely in the loop before any big decisions are made, especially about something as important as a community engagement process and finalizing our draft master facility plan. Um, Paul Hanley uh, worked for a company called George K. Baum. George K. Baum was uh, essentially a, a bond company, and, and that was Paul's umbrella company um, that he did his work uh, under. So when Paul was doing his work for District 99, which is our high school district, he was doing that under the umbrella of George K. Baum. Um, pretty much simultaneously as we were making our recommendation to our school board about engaging in a contract with Paul, uh, George K. Baum was sold to a company called Stifle. And so over the last month, um, Paul has been trying to figure out whether or not he was going to take an offer from Stifle or whether or not he was going to go seek employment elsewhere. Um, the work that Paul does and the people he works with wouldn't change, but certainly the umbrella company that he puts his services under would. At the same time that Paul was trying to figure out whether or not he was going to take an offer from Stifle, the, the new company, um, our architectural firm, White & Company, created a new subsidiary called Beyond Your Base. And that company uh, recruited Paul to uh, conduct his services and pretty much do the same thing but under a new subsidiary called Beyond Your Base. Because that company is owned by our 
architectural firm, um, it gave us enough pause to say, you know, we need to have a public conversation. Please know that um, Paul Hanley is a wonderful person. He did outstanding work for District 99. He knows our community very, very well. I, as the superintendent, don't believe that there would be any conflicts of interest when you look at the work that Paul does with, you know, third parties and survey questions. He's not creating those questions. Those are all created by other people. Um, but nevertheless, whenever you have somebody working toward perhaps securing funding for your district, and then on the back end, your architect would benefit from, from some of that, um, there was enough pause there to say, in the sake of transparency, we need to have a board discussion on that, even if that means delaying the vote for a month, which is exactly what the recommendation uh, is from the administration, to have a conversation to see, does the board need more information? Would the board like to hear something? Would the board like to go in a different direction? Um, we needed to make sure that we didn't start this work off on the wrong foot, but we started off by having this conversation. And so here we are, that's kind of our synopsis. Um, uh, again, um, I'm open to any questions. If the board would like to direct Todd or myself to, to get more information, I'm happy to do that. Um, I appreciate the board's patience with this. None of us could have predicted that any of this was going to happen, um, but here we are. Life throws you curveballs every once in a while, and um, I'll open it back up to the board for discussion and potential questions. Um, well, this definitely, uh, was an uh, interesting development. And uh, having worked with Paul as a community member in the past um, and seeing his work with District 99, and uh, I guess I would ask how he feels it's going to, how, how this new Beyond Your Base is going to work under the umbrella. Is it com like, I, I just would flat out ask him, like, do you see what's your? take on this like how do you feel moving forward is there any potential issues that you see happen so I've asked Paul that question I'm happy to answer that now but I can also go back to him and gather more information um, what Paul has shared with myself and in, in uh, with Todd is that he doesn't believe that this is going to impact his work at all uh, because it, it's literally the same team that he would have brought same cost same everything um, you know the only difference is who owns that company um, if we were to go forward with Beyond Your Base, uh, I think one of the stipulations that I would certainly make for the board is that you would write in there you would only work with Paul Hamley and, and you know his work or his team would be tied to us. But in terms of the work that he was going to do, I don't think you would see any change in, in the work, the proposal, the scope of services. I think it would be a very, very similar thing to what you would have seen with, with District 99 over the last several years. When I learned of this last week, um, I don't think I really had a strong reaction. Mm -hmm. um, probably because I wasn't seeing everything that I, what, what, when Darren called me, he, he explained to me, and I, under, I understood the concern, and, I, and I, I, he told me that, that Member Olchik, Olchik was also similarly concerned. Um, so I, I appreciated that. Um, I would hate to see the narrative around our, our master's facility, facility plan be something um, untowards, um, whether it's it's perceived or, or actual, I, I can't speak to, but I don't want anything to derail this. So I, it's given me great pause. I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, the only thing I would ask the administration to do is is just to reach out for advice, possibly from Hodges and Louise and the Illinois Association of School Boards, um, to get some feedback from them as to whether or not. Um, this raises any serious legal or ethical concerns that we should be considering as a board of education, um, and I and I because I think that's just we, we, you know you said it, Dr. Russell. We need to be very transparent with the community. Um, we need to make sure that they don't think that we're trying to, to pull something underhanded because it's going to completely derail everything. So um, I appreciate this the opportunity to have this conversation to take this very slowly. Um, my I again because I didn't see the conflict so clearly as, as uh, other board members saw, I, I would just appreciate some um, input from um, other people who have who've been there and done that. Mm -hmm. I would say um, having not directly, you know, had any 
experience with Paul, like, like Tracy did before, I, I was impressed with the work done on the 99 um, engagement that they, that they did. I thought they did a really good job with it, and I was excited for the opportunity to move forward. Um, I'm not entirely comfortable at this point. Um, you know, the, the, the saying that you don't bite the hand that feeds you, and I'm a little concerned that um, even though this is kind of just this umbrella and he's working under them and it's not really related and blah, 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 but at the same time, you know, if the work is going to eventually be funneled and, and go to white, that that's a little concerning to me that now we have kind of built this relationship where everything's a little bit intertwined and I'm not entirely comfortable, but um, I also really thought that that uh, what Paul did with 99 was great and I was excited about that so I'm not sure I'm kind of like a great sentence just made me take a little pause mm -hmm. and think how, how do we move forward now with what we now know and I don't I'm not sure how to go. So I'll, I'll let you take a different perspective so I, I hear that you know Paul was was great for multiple people you know and I guess I would just ask us up here what are we going to get with Paul that we wouldn't get with anybody else. I, I think now that we're looking at this through a different lens, I think, you know, Paul kind of rose to the top of the list before this, but now we have this additional variable that we need to talk through. Like, what would we be getting from Paul that we wouldn't be getting from the five others or whatever number was in that rubric that, that we went through previously? Well, yeah. having experience in, um, I mean, Paul brings to the table um, experience with our our community already with working with District 99 and knowing the community um, pretty intimately for working on it for a long period of time mm -hmm. um, with the Citizen Task Force um, and the administration and so on. So he would be bringing to the table that past experience of already like hitting the ground running. In my opinion, mm -hmm. he would he has that background because he's already been here in the community working asking the questions and so on for the high school district there were Where, two close ones that came together and it was his knowledge of the community and the rapport that he had built with them I think that that really tipped the scale um, anybody that you talk to seemed to really kind of <laughs> have a um, uh, that he really wants to understand you know that, that he was really taking his time to understand the community heart and I think that's why that's why we're even talking about this right now. I think that if, if there were two that were really close and he just edged them out and, and there wasn't such a connection here in Downers Grove already, I think we would have, might have just gone, ah, this, this looks a little iffy, let's just move on and move to the, the next one on the contract. I think it's that connection with Downers Grove that why we're... His successful connection. Right. You know, with, 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 Downer, with Downers Grove in, in general um, that, that kind of kept him on the table. Is there something you want to say? Well, I, I was going to just add, I mean, when we went through and evaluated and, and came through with the recommendation. Obviously, that's part of it, but we also looked at <clears throat> overall um, his advice, his structure, his process, um, and not that there wasn't, you know, someone else that would be similarly successful, but that seemed to fit everything that we had been going through for the, you know, with, with both the FPC process. Uh, and also what the board has, you know, has demonstrated and gone through um, in documenting their process, your process, uh, as to how it fit the best. Uh, it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be, you know, there wasn't another firm that wouldn't be as equally successful. It just seemed that was the better fit out of all. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, and in all honesty, he will tell you what you need to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, not what you you want to hear, um, which has been our you know our structure of making, and I think that's part of his success uh, that he's had both you know in this area, but also in other areas. So I, that's I, why the recommendation came. I from. I agree with what you said because in all the proposals that came in, uh, his notably I could I could be wrong, but I believe he talked about all the options need to be on the table, not just going forward with the master facility plan. Um, it was exploring all options, um, maybe not even ones that are already been talked about. And that to me seemed, that was a solid 
that was a big piece of it. A solid piece of it that mm -hmm. he talked about, well, maybe you need to think outside the box and think about some other things that you haven't already spelled out in any of these previous surveys and whatnot. So that was a selling point for me. I think ultimately, the only thing that would make me feel better about it, though, is knowing that there's some kind of firewall, some kind of separation, really, between the, the two organizations. And if, if there truly is a separation in that, that there's not collaboration in that, and there's a, a, a clean break, I, I can feel comfortable working with him. If, if I think that there's going to be bleed over there, I'm just, I, I, right, right, I'm, you know, in general, it's like, I need to have faith in, in the outcome and not that it's, it's serving somebody else's goal and not that I think that he would do that, but I, I, I worry about perception and everything else like that. Like I'd need, I would need to see some kind of solid, I can, firewall is the best example I can think of, but some kind of separation between, um, between the, the two organizations. Like, I mean, the fact that he wrote in his proposal exploring all options and things that weren't even already talked about to me is it compared to everyone else who just said, yeah, we're going to, you know, do phone surveys and so on about the master facility plan. And he's like, whoa, pump the brakes. We, we could look at other options as well. That, that seems to me that he, I don't know, it's, that's a solid. I mean, to me now, I totally agree, and that was definitely something that swayed me towards him in that phase of this process, for sure. Um, I would, like Darren was kind of saying, I would have to just be made to feel comfortable that still, going forward, now that his situation has changed, would still be a very solid part of his plan moving forward, and that that wouldn't be swayed or changed at all by the fact that he now is under the umbrella of white. That would be a concern of mine for sure. You know, is that still going to be a very strong focus moving forward, you know. You know, nothing really changes the strength of his um, of, of his response to our our uh, RFQ. Right. Um, I think we all we all really liked him. Uh, we all really like his past in in '99. Uh, but to kind of in thinking about the exchange between um, Steve and Tracy over there, um, you know, um, certainly he's somebody who we could we could hope would help us um, accumulate more yes votes. Um, but we know, just based on, on, on history, that there's going to be an organized effort to, mm -hmm. to shoot this down. And you know, for, for our best intentions, could, that we think we're gonna, he's going to help us get this over the top, if, if, this, if this gathers momentum, this, this could be, we could be shooting ourselves a foot. I don't have any, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to tip my hand here or, or say what we should do. Uh, these are just the questions that I'm going through in my head. I mean, are, we want to make sure that we are putting ourselves in the best position to be successful. And if this guy's baggage becomes a thing, um, it's, we're, we're make, that, that's a, a good way to make sure we're not. And you're right, I'm, I'm not even, and I should be, I'm not really focused on the second piece right now. Like I'm looking at it is, we've got a lot of information that we need to gather. And, um, and I'm, I'm sort of looking at this as, all right, we had our strategic plan and I'm, I'm trying to gather as much information uh, to get a real honest read on how people feel. You know, you talk to people and we've talked about this before and, and you hear what everybody wants and you're like, great, now it's gonna cost you this. And, and people go, wait, I, I didn't like it that much. <laughs> and, um, and so this is that opportunity now to actually have that real conversation. So uh, I need to have the trust of the community that we're not, that we're not just trying to get to that. Right. We want to build something. We're going to do something. We're trying to get to a, a referendum. I need them to, to know that they're engaging with us and we want to hear their real feedback. If they're like, forget it. it, it, it these kind of things, we don't want a six through eight middle school. We have to be willing to listen to that, uh, just as we would if, if they're like, no, that, this is critical and we need to do it. You know, so um, that relationship part is, is a big part of it, but that trust factor for, you know, if we end up in a position where we are going out and asking for dollars, we have to have the faith of the community there. And that's why having this conversation, you know, under the spotlights here um, is really, really important. Like, so. are we going to get um, honest and solid feedback from the community if? potentially they don't feel like they can trust the process because 
now there's this potential conflict of interest. So I think that is an important point. Like, our, we want this feedback from the community. I, I mean, I know I do. I, I want to know what they think. Like you said, we want to know if they think that the direction that, that the master facility plan is going is the right or the wrong or in the middle of the road or whatever. And if potentially could they feel like, oh, I'm not going to even bother to chime in because I don't feel like this is a, you know, good faith process here or whatever. So that, that's a little... And I think the understanding of anybody that's worked with uh, Paul Hanley is that none of this stuff that we're actually saying, do we, I, I don't think anybody on this board is actually worried about I'm not, happening. I'm not, I'm not worried the, at all. And I, that's what I wanted to clarify. It's the perception of what something might Yeah, but to, look to like. Greg's point, if, if we come a year later and somebody says, hey, that paycheck to that consultant is coming from the same company that is also your architectural firm that is getting X millions of dollars. Yeah. That's easy to um, appear and, or perceived to and if, appear as a conflict of interest. And and White and Company wasn't just the architect for for our Lester edition, for example. They also managed the project. Mm -hmm. right. So they, they they provided two roles to the district. Um, so it's it's, uh, it's 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 potentially a lot of money for White if right. they are again uh, and, and awarded just, that contract. Remember, they they just hired this gentleman, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, like if you kind of just look at it through that lens. They're, they're benefiting from this relationship already. I don't know, I, I, so I looked at, you know, I did my business code of conduct training recently, and so I, I went back and, you know, re read the definition that my company uses, and I'll, I'll pull it up here. It's, it's not necessarily that it is a conflict of interest. Um, you know, we must avoid situations that may create or even appear to create a conflict of interest. And I think in this situation, I don't think that, you know, it's benign. I, I think we would get great feedback and great engagement, but if we had somebody that wanted to challenge it later on, they could just say, hey, you know, the, the check was written by White and Company. So I, I, I think, personally, you know, I'm just one of seven up here, I think we, if we kind of go back to that RFQ process with a different lens, knowing that Paul probably would have given us um, wonderful um, results and, and wonderful deliverables that we could act on. But if we kind of go back to that RFQ process and, and really challenge ourselves, what caused Paul's firm to rise to the top? Can we get that elsewhere? And maybe the answer is no, and then we, we still go with Paul. But I think if we go back to that and kind of look at our rubric and, you know, intimate knowledge of the Donner Truck community, you know, was 25% of that score is it actually, it's 50% of that score, right? We're putting a lot of emphasis on, on that intimate community relationship or whatever. I've been doing a lot of listening up here. I'm just thinking back to our more recent experience. In the last two years, we hired HYA to do a strategic plan for us. Mm -hmm. They presented and pitched us on the superintendent search and we decided to go with a different firm. Mm -hmm. We felt like they, other firms can ramp up in meaningful ways, do their work, and ramp up in meaningful ways to give us great service. Um, the ramp up cost is something that these organizations should be building into their work because they can't sustain themselves on just working for the same district or same geography over and over again. So I am uh, i don't put a lot of weight in the fact that this person has done work with this geography before because if they're gonna do good work or people in this space will do good work, they have to be able to ramp up and learn about new, new communities. Um, and we've seen in the last couple of years that we've seen firms being able to come into Downers Grove and get familiar with us rather quickly um, and do great work in my opinion. And so uh, Steve, I, I appreciate the uh, ethics quote, which I think hits home uh, a ton for me of we operate with integrity, we operate with the perception of integrity uh, and um, there is a important lens for the seven of us sitting up here that uh, we should feel really good about the process we're going into I feel like it's the best fit. And one of the components of it should be, will this be received well by the folks that we represent? Uh, and so if, if it brings into question that dimension, um, we should take that into our calculus. And I don't know which way I'll lean, but that we should take that into our calculus uh, and ultimately make a vote based on the district's uh, administration's recommendation, mm -hmm. um, but also on our gut according to all of those things. Are they a good fit for us? Will they engage in the community? Do they have a track record of ramping up? Do they have a track record of being honest with their recommendations? And a number of other things that we should be considering, um, but not just the fact that they have experience in this community. Mm -hmm. 
So in general, it sounds like we really want to go back to the rubric process and reevaluate now that we have this new piece of information. But if I'm hearing the rest of the board correctly, nobody wants to eliminate Paul as a potential option for us at this point. But if for some reason that is still where it leans, we would need, like, we would have to have more information that would make, as of this point, we're not comfortable. There would have to be other components. Is that what I'm hearing or am I, am I off? Because I'm trying, I'm trying to, we're talking yeah, and I'm enjoying it, but I'm trying at to. at the same time? Yeah. Get the information from Paul about a definitive firewall versus waiting to see if that's who we would. I think whatever guidance we want to give Dr. Russell and his team for going back time. and evaluating the existing people and evaluating the circumstances now under which um, Paul is employed. This all came down fairly quickly, you know, um, and so we, it's a matter of, of now finding out where everybody, I think, on the board is, is comfortable going. Because I think this is one of those things with perception I want, I really want to make sure we have a nice clear consensus that, um, that we feel comfortable as yeah. a board. I think we keep all options on the table. For me, we keep all options on the table, go back to the rubric and figure out with perception and integ integrity being one of the components of it. Not that I question Paul's integrity, but the perception of integrity yeah. uh, is integrity one and the same to me. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I would, I would, my vote would be right now to keep all options on the table and ask the administration to go back to the rubric and come back with a recommendation. With that, is there any key information that you would like from either um, Paul, from Beyond Your Base, from White and Company, that, that, you want, that we should give uh, Kevin at this time to take? And obviously, at any point, if you guys have something, you guys can send that over. Um, I did try. That. I mean, I don't know how far along they are in this process of this company's creation and evolution, but I did try to find information about Beyond Your Base, and I could not find anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm not sure what that's about, but. No, it, it's yeah, a newly created sub subsidiary. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah it, it, it's, it's a newly created yeah. subsidiary. Yeah. So one of the things that, as I'm hearing, and, and I don't want to further muddy the water, we can certainly go back uh, to Member Harris's uh, point and, and, and Steve's point, and, and to really get those, you know, guiding documents. Would this board be interested in, um, you know, having Paul come back at the October meeting, and then having another? company come back in, the, in a very similar way to what you would have done in the superintendent search process where you you had a chance to have different presenters come in and really give you options so you would have the you know background information that I can certainly get to you well ahead of the next meeting but also have two perhaps three choices that you could ask the questions in a public forum to feel much more comfortable prior to you making that decision um, that is something that is a very common practice in school districts where the administration recommends, you know, here are our top choices based on the rubric that you've given us. Here's some things that um, you've asked, you know, for us to provide you information. And then at the October meeting, you could have, you know, Paul and Beyond Your Base come. Um, and you could also have, you know, based on the rubric, another recommendation by the administration for you to consider. You can ask these questions in a public forum and then it, have your conversation and then make a, an ultimate selection. Is that, is that best? I'm gonna come throw out the idea of maybe having a special meeting for that. You well, certainly could. Or would it? Because I mean, I could see that being an hour and a half to two hours on top of our regular mm -hmm. business, that oh, would be. right, to have them come in. Mm -hmm. But I'm just thinking timeline. I mean, we're out, would that move it back as far as a vote to two months then and then things not, I'm just looking at the, the bigger, um, if that's something we could then, if we have a special meeting or we throw some things on the workshop evening, I don't know. Well, this alone, we, we were getting real tight with everything as right. we were moving along to have an end of the year um, timeline anyway. Um, and this basically made that, um, I think, this already, just bumping it from this meeting, I think kind of made that in, impossible. But uh, I think that in general, you know, I, I more than anybody want to get this process 
moving. I think you know we we got a little bit of a slowdown when we had a transition process. Uh, when when Kerry was going to leave, we we saw a shift there, and then um, and now we're seeing an, you know another shift here at this point. It is it is really really important when we're talking about something as important as our facilities master plan to to take our time and do our due diligence. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's nice to be quick, but if you do things too quickly, then sometimes you just get yourself into trouble. So, but yes, it, it, this would continue to have an impact on us. Um, that is a good point, though, timing-wise. If, if we truly want to give these uh, people an opportunity to present to us, is there a better meeting than our, uh, our regular October um, business meeting um, to do that? Um, but thoughts, and would, would you guys prefer to see um, presentations by I like Dr. Russell's idea. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you get points for speed and community engagement, and so uh, <laughs> completely, I think this is all part of the process. And if it's if it's stretched a couple of months, so be it. Let's do it right. Yep. So one of the things we could do, I, I could work with the board president and Melissa uh, to try and identify a date for a special meeting uh, that would work. Um, some things for the board to think about before we close this discussion topic there are you know your next meeting is october 16th as i look at the calendar in front of me um, you certainly could have time that first week in october for a special meeting if you wanted to do that um, so would you be looking to have a special meeting prior to the next bigger board meeting would that make more sense for the board i i think that's something we should shoot for yeah if possible i think it's yeah. okay Pulling up the calendar, just I mean, yeah. not mine. I mean, just in general, like the calendar of where we are and where we need. I mean, that would probably be ideal if we could do that. Um, Does that mean that we would vote at the November meeting on which consultant to go with? No, I, I think you would have some options there. Um, so, for instance, if you had a special meeting between now and the next regular scheduled meeting in October you could have the potential for a vote at the October 16th meeting um, based off of the presentations. Um, then you could have a, a, a vote at, at that meeting or you could turn the study session and the, or excuse me, the workshop session at the end of October into a special meeting if you wanted to take a vote at that time if you weren't ready on October 16th. So by putting this special meeting prior to the October meeting, you, you could have several bites of the apple during the month of October. So you don't lose time, but you still take the time if that makes sense. So why don't we direct Melissa tomorrow to reach out to us and find a date that works within the first two weeks of October if we can all get together. Okay. With the with the top two? With the top two. So what we would do then as an so administrative team, obviously Paul would be in there. We would go back to the rubric um, based on the feedback that we got from the uh, Board of Education and um, we would then come out and uh, make a recommendation for the second one that you would want to see and we would bring both of those before you at the next meeting. You said special meeting. Special. So two is the number we want? Yes. We, I think before you said maybe two or three. Are we, is everybody okay with two? I, doesn't, I don't feel strongly about that, but I just want clarity. Thank it, you for that. Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, I think uh, you know that's free, free reign for the administration to figure out how many they want to bring in as long as we have that. I think you said it well, what is it, perception of integrity included in the rubric, right? So I think if we have that variable identified um, two or three or, or even four, whatever the administration <laughs> recommends, I'm guessing it's probably two, right? <laughs> no, not, not necessarily. I think this is really good, solid feedback. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about this conversation is just the, the value everyone places on transparency. And uh, we will go back and do our due diligence. And at the end of the day, if that's two more, then it will be two more. If it's one more, then it will be one more. But we will certainly, uh, you know, roll up our sleeves and, and go back to that process just like we did before. Um, full disclosure, there were really good firms out there when, when we looked before. I think what put Paul over the top was, um, you know, as Todd mentioned before, he's done great quality work, not only here in Downers Grove, but also um, in, in districts throughout Illinois, like Maine Township and New Trier. Mm -hmm. and, and those are pretty good communities, uh, you know, to, to to get a lot of good work done and his familiarity with Downers Grove put him over the top. That is nothing against some of those other firms 
that applied and, and, and took a look at it, and we will certainly go back and uh, gauge their interest and in, in, um, you know look at the rubric. I think for at least for me in that next presentation, a little shift would take into this new timeline and what their recommendation would then be based on their expertise as far as because if it does push everything back two or three months, what that does to a spring ballot versus a fall ballot with the fall being another presidential, I'd like to see that built into, is it something that we sit on? What is What the rates are for success if you have to sit on something? Or is it something that you have to put on a ballot right away? Because all that is going to obviously determine the outcome. I really appreciate that question and I think that is one that we should certainly um, ask the, these groups that are in front of us. Um, I know informally we certainly asked that as we were going through the process and we looked at kind of different timelines should the community direct us to, to go in that direction. Um, I do think um, based on the feedback that we got from all the groups um, most groups preferred um, delaying that to a November question right. versus a spring question. And there are several reasons and I can obviously let them speak for that. But um, so in terms of the timing from the board, I appreciate, you know, wanting to make sure that we get it right. And then based on the initial conversations that we had with many of the consulting groups, um, November would look a little more attractive at this point than a spring question should right. the community optimally get to that point. I think for me, just to, just to make sure like we're I'll go on the record. Um, we should be doing it on the timeline that makes sense for us to go to the community and ask the question. Correct. Not so much to game the system so that we get the community to give us the answer yes. based on the timing of the ballots. Yes. Uh, I think the perception of, again, of integrity is integrity. And we should be doing it on the timeline that we're most comfortable because we have the best information available to go to the community with the question that makes sense. Um, so uh, at least from my perspective, Timing is the timing is the timing, whenever that happens. I agree. Well said. Give me coke. Some timing is better than others, so I <laughs> And they have the expertise in that. That's why I would like information from them. Mm -hmm. Because that will, their integrity will help with making a decision whether they're honest or not. Mm -hmm. So at this point, um, Todd and I will certainly get back to work, and then uh, Melissa with the date. And um, I appreciate the transparency and the feedback we got from the Board of Education tonight. And um, we'll get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this point now, this is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to engage in a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We encourage you to keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Okay. At this time, we have not received any cards, so we ask that any, um, go ahead. We we'll ask anybody that now has a comment to feel free to walk up to the podium and make a comment. And when you do, uh, if, if you do, we ask that you please put some contact information down on the card if you'd like to receive uh, any communication back from us because we would like to follow up with you. So. Let's form a line because <laughs> <laughs> That. Everyone good skipping the recess? Mm -hmm. Yes. And with that, let's go on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the August 12th, 2019 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the August 12th, 2019 meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the August 26, 2019 budget workshop as presented? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, is there um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from the August 26, 2019 budget workshop as presented. 
on to the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? A second? Second. All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Yes. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. Two recommendations for action tonight. The first one is the surplus equipment, um, pickup truck, snowplow, John Deere tractor, soda machine, and a desk is recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to designate the 2009 GMC pickup truck, snowplow, tractor, soda machine, and metal desk as surplus equipment? So moved. Set. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to designate the 2009 GMC pickup truck, snow plow, tractor, soda machine, and metal desk as surplus equipment. Is there a motion to appoint Kirat Doshi as delegate and Emily Hannes as alternate delegate to the Illinois Association of School Boards Delegate Assembly at the Joint Annual Conference in November of 2019? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to appoint Kirat Doshi as delegate and Emily Hannes as alternate delegate to the Illinois Association of School Board Delegate Assembly at the Joint Annual Conference in November 2019. We have a couple of announcements here. Make note of some dates. Uh, Tuesday, September 17th at 7 a.m. is the policy committee meeting. Wednesday, September 25th at 345 will be the legislative committee meeting at the ASC. Uh, the policy committee was at the ASC as well. Tuesday, October 15th at 7 a.m. is the policy committee meeting at the ASC. And Wednesday, October 16th at 7 p.m. is a regular board meeting here at Village Hall. This board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, 5 ILCS 122C1, litigation when an action against, affecting, or on behalf of the district has been filed and is pe pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the district finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered in the closed meeting minutes, 5 ILCS. <coughs> 122 C 11 discussion of minutes uh, lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes as mandated by section 2.065 ILCS 122 C 21 so moved second any discussion all right Melissa please call roll member Harris aye member Olchik Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess at 9.55.